Shall we start now? Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I welcome you all the participants for the 12th online lecture series of standard treatment guidelines. I also extend my warm welcome to our guest speakers, Dr. Sangeeta Sharma, Professor Ibas, and President of DSPRUD. And our another guest speaker, Dr. Amit Gupta, Professor and Head, Department of Surgery, AIMS, New Delhi. I also welcome Dr. Deepika Sharma, Lead Consultant, Quality and Patient Safety Division, NHSRC. Today, we are conducting our 12th lecture series on the topics of prescription safety check, navigating drug interaction and avoiding errors, and also trauma management essentials, do's and don'ts for effective care. With this small intro, I request Dr. Deepika Sharma, ma'am, to uh, briefly uh, tell the objectives of the lecture series. Over to you, ma'am. Thanks, Anupurna, uh, and a very good afternoon, ma'am, as well as all the participants. Uh, so, uh, first of all, on behalf of National Health System Resource Center, a very warm welcome to all of you in uh, 12th uh, lecture on STG series. And uh, as uh, Anupurna has informed that today's session is on uh, prescription safety as well as in the trauma management uh, essentials, do's and don'ts for the uh, effective care. And uh, uh, we all know that specifically that trauma uh, management is very important and critical topic as uh, it is one of the leading cause of the premature sudden demise as well as disability of the individual. Uh, so if we look into the studies, it says that nearly every year, 1 billion people uh, uh, require medical care due to the different type of the injuries as well as we lose almost 5 million people uh, every year. If we look into the global burden of the injuries, it is 32% and more, 32% uh, more than even malaria, TB, um, HIV combined. And uh, uh, it not only affect the, uh, uh, basically the, um, I'll say that it will, it not only affect the disability, uh, affect the individual in term of death or disability, but also it uh, uh, kind of uh, affect on substantial economic loss every year. And uh, we know that in trauma, the most common cause of uh, uh, death or disability is the RTA, that is road traffic accident. And it is estimated that approximately 90% of the injuries or deaths take place in low middle income group countries. And if we look into the Indian context that overall 20% of the world trauma uh, or death occur in India, and if you look more critically about the reason of these particular deaths, then uh, it is half of these deaths took place specifically uh, on the scene as well as while uh, reaching to the hospital. But if you look into rest of the half of the deaths that take place uh, after reaching in the hospital, and uh, there are a debate going on that uh, deaths which taking place in the hospital within 24 hours, uh, then one week and after 30 days, these are very, very critical components. So uh, as uh, we are working with the primary care and secondary care institution, it is very, very much important that uh, the care which is providing to the trauma patient, patients are of utmost uh, uh, importance and because it is going to help us to avoid almost 2 million deaths annually. and. Uh, to deliver this particular session, we have Dr. Amit Gupta, a professor and head department surgery trauma aims. And uh, we, uh, we, uh, there is, uh, we uh, welcome sir, as well as um, for giving his uh, valuable time. Uh, and along with this, we have Dr. Sandeeta Sharma, ma'am, and you all know ma'am very well. And uh, ma'am is very popular in the states, districts, and whenever we interact with the, the uh, or, uh, audience who are working in the state and district, they usually say that they really love the sessions of MAM. And today, uh, MAM is going to talk on specifically uh, uh, prescription safety check. And uh, uh, lastly, not taking much of your time, uh, I'm happy to inform that we are going to continue this lecture series next year also. And the, the new uh, topics uh, in this particular series we are going to share with all the audience shortly. And uh, uh, again, uh, on behalf of NHRC, I uh, welcome you all in this lecture series and uh, it's our privilege to be connected with all of you as well as Dr. Sandeeta Sharma and their team. Ma'am is so kind that every time she arranges a faculty for us and there is 
uh, all the topics are uh, welcomed every time and people uh, love to you know uh, listen the topics again and again so thank you thank you so much ma'am and uh, i wish all the professionals from different dis disciplines will be benefited from this particular endeavor today as well as in future thank you and over to you thank you ma'am uh, thank you so much for your brief introduction and uh, telling the objectives of this session also the brief intro about the uh, today's sessions uh, with this i welcome dr sangeeta sharma ma'am uh, who is the professor at uh, ibhas that is institute of human behavior and allied sciences and also president of delhi society for promotion of uh, rational use of drugs to start the session on the prescription safety check over to you ma'am uh, thank you, Annapurna. Thank you, Deepika, for your kind introduction. And I also, uh, you know, I'm happy to hear the feedback, direct feedback that you get uh, when you are visiting the uh, these health facilities. Uh, uh, that makes, you know, all the efforts, whatever we are putting in, you know, uh, you know, it makes us happy, gives us the motivation to continue uh, uh, this uh, kind of series. And uh, we started this uh, during COVID time when there were restrictions uh, on movement. And uh, I also myself go as an assessor and I found uh, that, uh, you know, uh, Despite a lot of work, you know, there are certain gaps that we observe uh, at the health facility level. So we took this COVID as a blessing. Uh, you know, it was in fact a blessing in disguise here. And uh, I think uh, Anna Puna was the other day was telling me uh, a total of 13,000 people have so far attended various sessions. And many of you are returning also, uh, uh, you know, participants here for this session. So, you know, that gives us a very good, uh, uh, you know, motivation to continue these kind of endeavors. Um, with this, I also like to thank uh, uh, NHSRC uh, for joining hands and giving me this, uh, you know, liberty opportunity uh, to do the uh, sessions uh, and we continue, you know, um, for the second season as well. I call it a season, you know, when you can have uh, seasons of serials, why can't we have seasons of these sessions? So let's see that we will continue with these uh, series. So, uh, uh, you know, before, uh, uh, Okay, let me get into the subject. Uh, in all these uh, 12 sessions, you know, uh, we've tried to, uh, you know, touch various aspects of prescription, you know, be it from the writing point of view, irrationality, the economics point of view, the adverse drug reactions, uh, uh, special patient populations, elderly children, uh, patients with liver, kidney disease. And uh, of course, now the last session, uh, that of this season, uh, we have drug interactions. Uh, uh, we have chosen this because uh, many times uh, this is the reason when you don't get the optimal res uh, results. You know, there are many, uh, you know, drugs which we, uh, you know, may interact uh, and uh, either may exaggerate the effect or slow down the effect or, you know, there may be an antagonism. So, you know, uh, I remember as a pharmacology student, you know, uh, this was always, you know, crammed up without, uh, you know, at, uh, understanding the basics behind it. And if we know the rationale behind it, you know, why such and such interaction is taking place, what all can happen uh, because of various events that are taking place, uh, I think then we will be wiser when we are writing these prescriptions. So today, uh, you know, my endeavor is to demystify a drug interaction. So you don't have to cram up anything or, uh, you know, you just understand. I'm trying to give you a perspective here uh, with, uh, of course, a lot of uh, examples taken from, uh, you know, day-to-day -day prescribing. 
uh, I have particularly refrained from using uh, drug interactions, which are uh, not very commonly used. You know, so I, I see I was looking at your uh, the pretest and the, uh, you know, demographics, you know, uh, we have uh, people from all the um, levels of healthcare from different sectors of healthcare. So let, uh, you know, I have made it uh, in a try to made it in a manner so that everyone one finds it uh, interesting uh, for them. Uh, can you see my uh, screen? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So uh, today we will be navigating these drug interactions and how do we avoid errors, uh, uh, you know, because of these drug interactions. Uh, there are three phases of drug actions, you know, where uh, things can go wrong. Uh, one is the, uh, the pharmaceutics, you know, uh, the uh, dosage form of the drug, you know, uh, itself may be responsible for something. Then pharmacokinetic, we all know uh, it is absorption, how a drug is absorbed, distributed, metabolized, and excreted from the body. And then pharmacodynamics deals with, you know, the drug action, what the drug does to the body. Pharmacokinetics is what body does to the drug, you know. So that's how, you know, how is it absorbed, distributed, metabolized, and excreted. Whereas pharmacodynamics is the what does drug does to the body. So this may happen, this will decide the onset of action, when will be the peak action obtained and the duration of response to a drug and uh, the uh, actions takes place at the level of receptors, enzymes and hormones. So uh, if you look at the prescribing errors, you know, a uh, drug drug interaction has been uh, labeled as the top most reason uh, for prescribing errors. You know, this is one of the systematic reviews done on medication uh, errors and there they reported about 68% of the errors were contributed due to drug-drug interaction. Then, of course, incomplete prescription, incorrect drug, monitoring uh, problems, underdose, interval uh, dose duration, overdose. These were other uh, factors which were, uh, you know, reported as the prescribing errors. And then there is another uh, analysis of uh, uh, reported drug interactions. Uh, this is, uh, they, lab, uh, you know, gave a title, a recipe for harm to patients. So this is one way that we, you know, although we don't intend to cause any harm to the patient, uh, but we uh, cause harm because of this, you know, uh, drug interactions, which we, uh, you know, uh, go unnoticed, you know, either because the drug was incompatible or the, the drugs were interacting, I will explain, or there was a therapeutic duplication. Drugs from the same class or, you know, uh, similar medicines were given together and uh, sometimes uh, drugs which are contraindicated for a particular patient are also given together. So that can also give rise to, uh, uh, you know, Know, these drug interactions. I, for example, uh, you know, to start with, I can give you a few examples which caused harm to the patient. Uh, for example, uh, in this patient was taking an anticoagulant and a NSAID. Uh, this patient experienced severe uh, GI bleeding due to drug interaction because perhaps this was warfarin uh, or, uh, you know, uh, aspirin-like drug given with NSAIDs, both cause uh, gastritis. Uh, so there may be uh, gastric ulcers, which lead to gastrointestinal bleeding. Then there was another incident where a patient was prescribed an antidepressant agent and anti-migraine medication. Uh, so, uh, and this led to serotonin syndrome, uh, which is a potentially a life-threatening condition. Uh, then uh, yet another example uh, uh, is a, a combination of ACE inhibitor and a potassium sparing di diuretic such as amyloride. This can increase uh, potassium retention. That means it can cause hyperkalemia. So, uh, which is again a life threatening uh, uh, situation. Uh, we know both hypokalemia and hyperkalemia both can be life threatening. So, we need to be really very careful about this interaction. Uh, taking place between ACE inhibitor and potassium sparing uh, antagonists. 
sorry, di diuretics. Then uh, again, uh, the antihypertensive effect of ACE inhibitors can be weakened by painkiller. Uh, so uh, painkillers cause fluid ret uh, retention and, uh, you know, by increasing the fluid retention, uh, they can nullify the effect, uh, hypotensive effect of ACE inhibitors. So uh, like this, uh, you know, there may be an increased uh, cardiac risk if uh, patient with coronary heart heart disease, uh, who are on uh, prophylactic aspirin, uh, who are given ibuprofen or naproxen. So there is a, a, a you know, interaction taking place. Then, uh, you know, a lot of we need to be worrying about this uh, because a lot of patients are also taking over the counter medications, which can interact with each other, like, uh, you know, iron supplements, herbal supplements, nutritional uh, supplements, salt substitutes, all of these uh, can interact uh, uh, with the regular uh, prescription drugs and ca can cause harm to the patients. Uh, so now we know the uh, size of the problem. Uh, now let's get into the mechanism of it. What do you mean by drug interaction? Uh, it means modification of the effect of a drug A by concurrent administration of other drugs B, C, or D. You know, uh, as long as you were giving drug A, there was no problem. But as soon as you add another drug, drug B is added, uh, the, uh, there is a modification in the response. So this is what is called drug interaction. So remember, whenever you add a medication, then only drug interaction will happen. If a patient is on single uh, this thing, uh, interaction is not likely to happen. So as I said, these interactions can be within, with other prescription drugs, with food, with supplements, with other diseases. Even, you know, there are uh, d drug disease interactions as well. I'll be dealing with that. So uh, the outcome of this interaction could be three. Either it can lead to decreased action of drug or it can lead to increased action of a drug or it can cause a, a adverse effect to a patient. So now how does this, uh, you know, uh, interaction, how does this alteration happen? Uh, there are four uh, things, you know, which can happen. Therapeutic antagonism, you know, if you, you know, this is very well illustrated here. If drug A is given with drug B, which is in the, uh, so the antagonism, the in, impact is uh, minus zero. Uh, the, there is no effect of either the, of the drugs. Additive effect is where one plus one is two. So you are just adding uh, the impact here. Uh, synergism is when one plus one is more than two. Uh, so it is more than mathematical response to a drug. So one plus one is more than two here. You see four here. Potentiation is uh, when drug A is given with drug B, uh, although it does not have its uh, own uh, uh, action of its own, but when given together, uh, there is potentiation. So one plus zero is equal to two. Uh, one good example of this is, you know, painkiller usually do not cause sedation, but when given with the uh, anti-allergic uh, medicines like cetrazine, uh, when uh, these uh, NSAIDs given with uh, cetrazine, they can lead to increased sedation uh, with anti-allergic medicines. So I, I hope you understand. If you understand the concept here, uh, it would be easier for you to understand what is the mechanism going on. Uh, so and accordingly, then you can deal with these interactions. Then, you know, uh, for there are a few examples. I've given few examples here where there is additive interactions. One plus one is two. It is adding, you know, uh, drug A, is, for example, NSAIDs, and then uh, SSRI, selective um, serotonin receptor inhibitors, uh, antidepressants, glucocorticoids. This can lead to increased risk of bleeding uh, and gastric bleeding uh, can be there. Similarly, I told you ACE inhibitors with uh, potassium sparing diuretics can lead to hyperkalemia. Uh, then uh, antidepressants of different class, SSRIs and trypta, uh, the tryptans are 
uh, anti-migraine uh, medicines uh, when given together can cause serotonin sy syndrome. So like this, there are, you know, quinolones when given with macrolides uh, like azithromycin, uh, erythromycin, roxithromycin, uh, they, it can lead to QT interval prolongation and torsidy point is. So uh, then antagonist uh, interactions uh, are, you know, uh, acetyl salicylic acid given with ibuprofen uh, leads to reduced effects. Uh, ACE inhibitors with NSAID, I told you, uh, reduced uh, BP lowering effect. Levodopa, when given with neuroleptics, uh, the antipsychotic uh, drugs, you know, uh, uh, antipsychotics act by uh, inhibiting the uh, dopamine receptors, levodopa is an agonist here. So when given together, a uh, reduced effect will be there. Similarly, uh, cumarons given with vitamin K, reduced effects will be seen. Now, there are, uh, where do all these interactions take place? There are three, uh, you know, uh, types of interactions. One is in vitro. Uh, incompatibility. In vitro means outside of the body uh, that the uh, interaction takes place when we mix uh, two or three uh, drugs together, uh, I, either when we have to give it as an infusion, uh, either we are mixing it with the um, uh, dextrose or saline or lactated uh, ringer solution or you know sometimes uh, uh, we mix two uh, di different types of drugs in one injection and administer, you know, this usually happens, you know, many times we don't want to cause inconvenience to patient of two pricks. So, uh, you know, nurses, sometimes they combine these drugs. So these in vitro incompatibility can happen there. Then there are in vivo type of uh, income, uh, you know, in vivo, as I told you, it could be pharmacodynamic uh, because what the, uh, you know, drug does to the body and it could be pharmacokinetic, how the absorption, metabolism, excretion is uh, altered. And then it could be food drug interactions, you know, the type of food we take, you know, some drugs we know that are uh, to be taken empty stomach, some are to be taken with the full stomach. And then lastly, there could be a drug disease interaction. So these are the different types of interactions that can take place. I will give you the example of each of these. Now, other there are other factors which may influence uh, drug actions, uh, you know, genetic factors, of course, you know, uh, they they make us different. Uh, each patient is different, may not uh, act in the same way, but uh, it may happen, uh, you know, because, uh, you know, because of the genetic variation, the response may not of the, be of the same intensity, uh, age, height, weight, other uh, physical conditions, uh, uh, obesity, um, uh, organ function, or mental conditions. So these can also uh, alter the drug actions. Now let's take uh, the uh, some of the exam. Uh, give me a uh, uh, in a moment here. There's someone uh, uh, on the door. I'll just come back. Okay, uh, some of the examples of incompatibility in vitro drug interaction. You know, many a times we think that the outside of the body interaction takes place whenever there is a color change or discoloration happens or uh, there is a precipitate uh, or, you know, the uh, uh, the drug or the uh, solution becomes cloudy, turbid. Uh, then we know uh, these are the physical interactions that we can see with visible eyes, but this may not be uh, always the case. Uh, still uh, interaction may take place and you may not come to know uh, by just looking at the uh, you know mixture here. So don't think if there is no change in color, precipitate or turbidity uh, that uh, interaction did not take place. So that is why we say that do not combine these incompatible combinations. For example, ketamine with barbiturate, uh, diazepine, 
higher pentone with succinethonium. Uh, insulin is well, well one good example. Uh, you should never combine regular insulin with the lente uh, uh, insulin because then uh, the entire uh, you know mixture will become uh, long acting. Uh, regular will bind to lente and it will become long acting. So uh, soluble insulin should not be combined with uh, uh, protamine zinc sulfate. Similarly, when you have to give phenytoin uh, for status epilepticus, so, you know, uh, it is given by IV root, it precipitates in dextrose solutions. So it is always given in a saline uh, solution. Similarly, amphotericin also precipitates in uh, saline. So you need to know uh, which one is compatible with which IV fluid. Uh, you know, uh, it may not be true for all the, uh, you know, uh, then, uh, Uh, then uh, gentamicin is physically and chemically incompatible with most beta lactams. So never combine gentamicin with beta lactam uh, cephalosporins uh, because then it will lead in, uh, to the loss of antibiotic effect. Uh, ampicillin, benzyl penicillin uh, are not to be mixed with dextrose solution, dextron, oxytetracycline uh, are not to be combined with calcium and magnesium containing solutions. Like this, you know, adrenaline is not combined with sodium bicarbonate. Uh, heparin uh, should not be combined with dextrose solutions. So uh, you, you need to remember uh, some of these. If you are using any of these drugs, so perhaps it is a good idea that you make a chart of it and uh, display it somewhere so that you can uh, have a look at it, you know, when you are administering. Uh, then similarly, uh, when you mix two drugs together uh, outside in Vitro. So the uh, you know ceftriaxone when given with the lactated ringer solution, it can also precipitate. So piperacillin, uh, tazobactam uh, should not be combined with acyclovir, amphotericin. Uh, then uh, you know uh, they, there are you know here you can see the visible effect, whereas here you may not see the visible effect here. So just uh, you know. Uh, you need to know that whether you can mix this or not. Then next site, you know, where the interaction can take place. Most commonly, uh, medicines are given by oral route, so tablets. So GI, you know, is the first place. Gastrointestinal tract is the first place where interaction can happen. Uh, then um, because, you know, drug would reach the uh, circulation by this route only by after absorption going through the liver and then it distributes uh, to the entire body. So food and drugs can alter the fraction of the drug reaching the circulation. You know, you have, must have read about first pass effect. You know, many of the drugs undergo uh, high first pass metabolism. You know, in one circulation through the liver, majority of the drug is me metabolized. So, uh, oral uh, make, uh, making oral route unsuitable for this type of drug. So, but this can uh, you know happen. Uh, you know, if you are giving two drugs together, uh, they may alter the. Uh, first pass effect and uh, alter the availability. Now, uh, the, uh, the uh, GI tract is the most important uh, site where inhibition of absorption can happen. Uh, either the drug may bind in the GIT, it may affect the motility of the uh, GI tract, uh, or it may alter the pH, or it may alter the GI flora. So any of these four mechanisms can happen and inhibit the absorption. Uh, the most uh, uh, common example, the commonly administered drugs are antacids and iron. Uh, both antacids and iron, they may chelate with fluoroquinolones. So don't give them together. 
I'll tell you, you know, you need to space these medicines. When I say don't give them together, does not mean uh, that you will not give uh, iron uh, to an anemic patient who also needs a fluoroquinolones. Uh, but, you know, how do you administer uh, makes a difference. Similarly, azithromycin uh, interacts with antacids, iron, tetracyclines, INH. So these can result in decreased absorption. They slow down the anti anticoagulants uh, absorption, motility is decreased, you know, uh, metoclopramide is gastric hurrying agent uh, and uh, it may uh, decrease the uh, absorption of ceprazil. Uh, pH is altered by the omiprazole. Omiprazole is a prodrug. Prodrug means it is converted into an active drug uh, inside the body. So it needs an acidic pH. It needs an acidic pH to activate to the active drug. But if you give, uh, you know, uh, antacids here or alkana is the, uh, you know, GI tract or with food, uh, it may uh, decrease the absorption and it may also decrease the absorption of ketoconazole and other antiviral drugs. Uh, flora may be altered uh, by uh, any of the antibiotics. Uh, they decrease vitamin K production they augment the anticoagulant effect. Uh, in the GI take, uh, track, you know, the caffeine uh, coffee that we take, it can increase the anti-inflammatory action of aspirin. Aspirin uh, can reduce the elimination of penicillin and ethanol, uh, alcohol. Uh, uh, this is a very common, alcoholism is very common. It can and has the hepatotoxicity of paracetamol and INH. So uh, be careful, uh, caution the patient uh, if they are also consuming alcohol while taking these medications. Then there is another set of interaction that may happen because of the food. The, uh, as I told you, uh, ampicillin when taken with food, absorption is reduced. So uh, uh, diarrhea would be more when taken with food. Uh, omiprazole when taken with food absorption is again reduced then many of the mineral oils taken with fat soluble uh, uh, vitamins a d e can decrease the absorption of these vitamins and particularly uh, uh, you know the specific interactions uh, have been uh, uh, you know specified with alendronate uh, which is given for osteoporosis uh, it has lots of uh, uh, food drug interactions action so patient is not supposed to uh, you know eat anything uh, before uh, the first food and all that so uh, there are very very specific instructions uh, for alendronate so please look into that uh, and then anticoagulant any prescription any patient uh, who is on warfarin uh, this is an alarm uh, uh, trigger for you to think that it can cause uh, drug interaction, various drug interaction, and especially food rich in uh, vitamin K, broccoli, Brussels, sprouts, spinach, and kale, uh, all of these can interact with warfarin and reduce the effectiveness of anticoagulant. So it's very, very important uh, that you instruct the patient uh, uh, about these uh, foods and uh, uh, intake of these foods should be limited and the amount consumed daily should remain constant. If the pa patient cannot uh, eliminate these foods, it should remain constant, then the action can be stabilized. But if uh, sometimes a lot of uh, these uh, uh, leafy vegetables are taken and sometimes not, so the response may alter. Then similarly, grapefruit juice, uh, you know, this is uh, a... Um, something this grapefruit juice uh, is, is similar to orange it's an accidental hybrid, hybrid between two types of fruits looks very much like an orange but uh, there are small differences but this may inter well this is also healthy uh, but it may interact with uh, some of the benzodiazepines, calcium channel blockers like pelodipine, nifedipine, cyclosporine, uh, hormones, estrogen and oral contraceptives and statins, simvastatin, lovastatin, uh, like that. And, uh, you know, uh, these interactions take place at 
at the metabolism level, so their response may be altered. Sildenafil, uh, some people are taking, it can lead to uh, headaches, flushing, hypertension. So, as I told you, tetracycline, when taken with calcium uh, or food containing calcium, you know, whenever, uh, you know, you say that there is an interaction between a drug and calcium, so all, always consider milk and milk products also as part of the interaction. Milk products, I, when I say even tea, you know, uh, it may be taking, uh, having a small amount of milk, but it has the potential to cause um, interaction. So spacing of the uh, drug and these type of foods and supplements, uh, either they should be taken one hour before or two hours after eating. So that will reduce the chance of these interactions. So there are, you know, fruit juices. Many of times patients come and ask you whether they can take the medicine with the fruit juice, uh, whether uh, they can take the medicines with a cold beverage or, uh, you know, uh, so generally it is always better to take it with plain water because fruit juices, these antibiotics can reduce the therapeutic effect, cold beverage again can reduce the therapeutic effect uh, of these antibiotics green leafy vegetables again uh, can lead to decrease uh, sugar you know many of the patients think uh, since they are on hypoglycemic agents they are already taking these medicines so they feel free to take you know sugar also so but we know the, the there is an antagonism here hypoglycemics are reducing sugar levels where as uh, sugar, the, especially the refined uh, sugar that we take will antagonize. So it blocks the drug actions. So uh, the key to avoiding food drug interaction is, uh, you know, uh, can be avoided by taking the drug one hour before or two hours after eating. Uh, one of the very uh, common example, another example is iron and calcium being given in ANC clinics. Uh, and many of us uh, notice that uh, uh, that the um, and we say uh, the quality of the drug supplied is poor because uh, uh, inside uh, despite uh, patient uh, being given iron for so long uh, hemoglobin is not increasing. Um, I see one of the major reason for no response is this drug interaction because uh, we don't explain uh, this enough to the patient uh, of the interaction taking between iron and calcium and milk products. So uh, uh, we can't say either we will give iron or I or we will give calcium to this patient. Uh, but if we uh, you know tell them take either uh, by taking drug one hour before or two hours after eating that will avoid take care of this interaction. Then coming to alcohol, you know, uh, is another uh, big uh, reason uh, for many uh, drug interactions. We don't elicit this history actually uh, from the patient before prescribing these uh, medicines. Cough medications, as you know, already have some alcohol or, you know, some uh, uh, you know, a depressant type uh, of the drug is there. So it can in lead to increased drowsiness and decrease alertness. So you have to caution the patient that he should not indulge in driving or, uh, you know, motor, you know, doing a work with the uh, equipments which require alertness. Some antibiotics can cause flushing, headache, palpitation, nausea, vomiting, disulfiram-like reaction may happen. Uh, uh, you know, particularly this uh, uh, disulfiram-like reaction may happen with some of the antidiabetics like chlorpropamide, gliburide, glipizide, and um, warfarin also because they, um, uh, you know, alcohol inhibits the warfarin metabolism and can cause disulfiram-like reaction. Uh, metformin uh, and uh, sedatives, hypnotics, tricyclic antidepressants, they, uh, their metabolism is decreased, they may enhance sedation or may cause lactic acidosis. So be careful. Uh, vitamin A, 
uh, you know, there are chances uh, if the patient is also taking alcohol, uh, retinol induced hepatotoxicity may happen. Vitamin D uh, may be less effective because hydroxylation is uh, hampered here. So caution the patient not to take these uh, uh, drugs, uh, you know, uh, along with alcohol, at least one week uh, abstinence should be there. Then uh, another category of interaction could be drug herb interaction. Many of us believe uh, that herbs are harmless. Uh, but, you know, it is not true. They can also cause significant interaction and can cause harm to the patient. So please be careful, you know, patient may not mention these things to you during your uh, en encounter uh, for prescription, uh, but you need to, especially some of the drugs which are important. Uh, you know, recently uh, there was a news article, uh, this is very recent, 1st August, uh, uh, you know, this patient died of herbal supplement toxicity. Uh, because uh, there was a lead content uh, in that herbal supplement. So the patient was thinking that uh, for her sugar level, she was taking this uh, supplement and it caused sub, uh, toxicity in this patient. So please uh, be careful, caution the patient on these supplements. Then um, there may be uh, different kinds of pharmaceutical issues. You know, sometimes some patients do not take uh, the medicine, uh, you know, they may split uh, the, uh, you know, tablet uh, or they may open the capsule. Uh, so, uh, you know, they may it may change the way in which a dosage form is presented. It can alter the absorption. It can result in instability. It can cause local irritant effects. So, um, so there may be occupational health and safety issues, uh, particularly when you crush products uh, like carcinogenic, uh, tamoxifen, methotrexate, or it may have teratogenic effect, belgan cyclovir. So uh, please do not alter the pharmaceutical dosage form. And also many of the patients uh, we have uh, in uh, IPD uh, are on nasogastric feeding. So, you know, we have to give uh, enteral nutrition and enteral formulations to these patients. So be careful about uh, the enteral feeding catheter, uh, you know, what all medicines can be given uh, through this nasogastric tube and how, so because the uh, same kind of incompatibility that I showed earlier may happen uh, when you are mixing uh, two or three drugs, you know, uh, together in the field and giving it by. So, uh, by and large, do not mix medication directly in the enteral formula. And then, um, you know, uh, there are, you know, many of us also believe, uh, you know, if the patient is not able to take orally and on uh, nasogastric tube, you can crush the medication and give it. Uh, it may not be true, you know. There are, uh, while plain uh, preparations can be crushed and given, but uh, altered or modified dosage forms uh, like uh, long acting, slow release, extended release uh, preparation where the, uh, uh, the, the preparation is modified uh, to release the drug slowly in the body. So if you crush these medicines, uh, all of the drug will be re released together at one time and can lead to adverse uh, drug reactions and can also lead to um, irritant effect on the GI. Similarly, enteric coated tablets, you know, they have been coated, uh, you know, because we do not want them to be absorbed in the stomach. So we want that their absorption should take place after crossing the stomach. So enteric coated medicines, these modified long release, slow release, extended release, long acting. So wherever you find these XL, SR, SL, you know, do not crush this and uh, we, uh, you know i can urge you you identify the medications that you are prescribing or using in your hospital and make a list of uh, do not uh, crush list uh, uh, items and display it and everybody should know about this that they are not supposed to crush these so ismp has given this list you may go through this but but i gave you the formula you know any modified 
preparation and any enteric coated uh, preparation should not be crushed. Then, um, then interactions can take place at the distribution side because they bind to plasma protein. They are, uh, you know, lipid soluble or water soluble that, like that. So uh, then uh, metabolism, um, uh, you know, this is the very important uh, uh, stage where the interaction take place. Uh, the there are enzymes in the liver which will metabolize the drug. So these may be induced. The enzymes may be induced or inhibited by some drugs. When these enzymes are induced, that means the metabolism of the drug would be enhanced faster. So the, that means the drug will be eliminated uh, from the body quickly. So induction means the drug failure would be there. You know, one very good example is oral contraceptives, anti-epileptic drugs, and uh, this one, um, anti-tubercular drugs. So these are all inducers. So you may find oral contraceptive failure. You may find breakthrough seizures happening. You may find uh, that, uh, you know, uh, I said uh, breakthrough anti-epileptic uh, TB, uh, the patient may not be responding. Uh, the inhibited, when you say the, the drug is uh, enzyme inhibitor, that means the enzymes will be inhibited. Enzymes will be inhibited, but that means the drug would remain in the body for a longer time because, uh, you know, many of the drugs are metabolized uh, to uh, inactive metabolites and then excreted. Since the metabolism is now slowed down, the drug will remain in the body for a longer time. So that means that there are chances of accumulation of this drug in the body. So be very careful, uh, you know, about uh, uh, which is the enzyme inducer or which is the inhibitor. Uh, so accordingly, I give you the example, mostly drugs are inducers and these Three, four classes are the most commonly used. Warfarin is also a, a inducer here. Valproic acid is an inhibitor. And some of the uh, antiviral drugs, they are inhibitors. So be careful about this. Then last uh, stage where interaction pharmacokinetic can happen is at the excretion. This They may compete with each other for excretion. Uh, they may have the concentration effect. Uh, they may affect the, uh, you know, furosemide enhances the lithium toxicity, INH inhibits diazepam, so enhanced diazepam response may be there. Then uh, amongst the, uh, you know, physiological uh, interaction is, you know, when you give aspirin, uh, an antiplatelet drug with anticoagulant here. So there are chances that we can, uh, you know, one is antiplatelet, so, uh, you know, increased bleeding would be there. Dynamic is, uh, you know, as I told you, the, what drug does to the body, uh, the drug B can either increase the effect of drug A or it can decrease the effect of drug A. So either increase or decrease may happen. Uh, Antihistaminics uh, may increase the sedative effect of uh, barbiturates, transkillizers, alcohol, pain relievers, I told you. Decongestants in cold and cough medication can interact with di uh, diuretics or water pills to aggravate the high blood pressure. Uh, then uh, sugar, I gave you example. Cephalosporins, when uh, taken with amylog uh, Aminoglycosides, particularly gentamicin, can lead to renal toxicity. Corticosteroids have, uh, uh, they increase the uh, sugar level. They cause hyperglycemia, so they decrease the hypoglycemic action of the uh, glipizide, glimipride, like this. So be careful, you know, when you are giving these drugs together. So there are lots of such examples. Uh, by and large, uh, uh, you know, some of the, uh, you know, drug classes which have opposing uh, clinical effects uh, is, uh, you know, painkiller with antihypertensive. So, but many of your patients, uh, 
elderly patients are also having osteoarthritis. They may be taking these uh, NSAIDs and they may be also hypertensive. So be careful. You need to adjust the dose here. Uh, similarly, diuretics and hypoglycemic agents, steroids and hypoglycemic, beta blockers and uh, agonists, CNS depressants and uh, uh, caffeine like or symptomatic, warfarin and vitamin K. K, lithium and um, NSAIDs, these combinations uh, have opposing. Uh, so by and large, uh, the common interacting uh, drugs are antacids. Cimatidine is no longer used, but uh, uh, this uh, drug went into disrepute because of the drug interaction it caused. Digoxin, warfarin, theophylline, ketoconazole. Now we have better drugs, but uh, some of these still, still have these interaction. Now coming to the last part of the drug interaction, drug Drug disease interaction uh, that may take. The patient may be having liver disease, kidney disease, cardiac, uh, maybe having a uh, myocardial infarction, viral infections, hypothyroidism, which is very, very common. Uh, even hyperthyroidism may alter the uh, response to a drug. So, you know, asthma, generally remember that beta blockers should not be given because they can cause bronchospasm. Similarly, beta blockers should not be given to a diabetic, especially the non-selective one, propranolol, uh, you know, because this will, uh, you know, uh, you know, suppress the uh, hypoglycemic uh, presentation because hypoglycemia presents like headache, tremors, uh, palpitation, sweating, and beta blockers have all the blocking effects. So uh, the hypoglycemia may not be, you know, uh, recognized uh, in these patients. So in diabetes, especially the non-selective ones should not be given. Similarly, hypertension, painkillers, decongestant, pseudoephedrine is banned, but uh, still I see so there are some preparations uh, uh, where uh, pseudoephedrine is there. So it can increase uh, blood pressure. Similarly, uh, epilepsy, uh, you know, uh, in respiratory failure, sedatives, neuroleptics, uh, chronic liver failure, warfarin can increase the risk of bleeding. Uh, uh, similarly, uh, hypothyroidism, there are lots of uh, interaction, uh, which, uh, you know, ways in which the drug response may be altered. So again, this could be because of the GI binding, distribution, metabolism and thyroid function interaction. So remember, uh, you know, uh, antacids, sucralfate, polystyrene, uh, ferrous sulfate, uh, when, uh, you know, the interaction may happen when started, uh, any of these drugs added or adjusted or stopped. So you need to readjust the thyroxine uh, dose in these patients. So, and it would require monitoring of thyroid function. Similarly, oral contraceptives, um, again, it may alter metabolism, uh, enzyme induction by rifampicin, carbamazepine, phenytoin. So this can enhance the thyroid hormone metabolism. So you need to increase the dose of uh, uh, thyroxine here. So, and uh, therefore it can lead to clinical hypothyroidism. So monitoring is required. So then similarly, lithium on long-term uh, can cause thyroid uh, function interaction. Uh, clinical hypothyroidism may be there. Uh, so the problem, uh, you know, as I said in the beginning, uh, you know, greatest problem uh, with us is uh, in medical uh, practices, patients with the same complaint, finding, diagnosis, treatment, but the effect is differential. This could be because of the physiological factor, pathological, food, drug interaction, and the genetics. So a ge a drug interaction being avoidable, you should be. And elderly are at especially the risk of uh, drug interactions because they have comorbid illnesses, they have multiple prescribers, each of them not knowing what is being prescribed by the other. So they are receiving multiple medications, maybe from the same class or from the opposing class, and they don't, uh, uh, you know, well, edu are not educated. Uh, they are not uh, li uh, literate about their medicines. Uh, uh, so they may be having poor adherence. Uh, there may be age-related changes 
cognition may be declining, sensorium may not be good. So, and they are also taking a lot of non uh, prescription drugs. So, be careful uh, when you are prescribing. So, uh, the outcome, as I said earlier, it could be harmful. Uh, it could be uh, beneficial, harmful when it increases the toxicity or it when uh, decreases the efficacy. Uh, beneficial when it is increases the efficacy uh, activity. So, so that is why certain drugs are combined also. Uh, you know, you know uh, uh, the sulfamethoxazole and trimethoprim combination is given because together, uh, when given together, uh, these uh, four trimethoxazole becomes bactericidal, whereas each of this drug alone is bacteristatic. Similarly, penicillin is combined with provenicid, hydrochloride is, is combined with spironolactide. So, we may use this drug interaction for our beneficial uh, use. Um, largely, most of these interactions have no clinical significance, but certainly we need to avoid the harmful uh, interactions. So, uh, one of the strategies for a, a safe prescribing is medicine reconciliation. Uh, keep making, uh, you know, the up-to-date list of medicines being taken by the patient. This will happen with regular review of the regimen being taken and the patient's education uh, about this. So, a review uh, should be done. Um, you may use electronic health records, prescriptions, and update this re regularly. Uh, this can, you know, happen with interdisciplinary collaborations uh, between uh, different providers, physicians, nurses, pharmacists, specialists, and especially for, uh, transition points, you know, be very careful. Uh, this is the time for uh, duplication or omission and uh, possibility of drug interaction is there. So, avoid polypharmacy as far as possible. Uh, remember that the uh, interaction will take place only when you add another drug to a stable regimen. So, uh, you know, when you add another drug, either it may increase the effect or may decrease. Uh, so, uh, avoid polypharmacy. And if this is necessary, monitor these patients closely for some time to avoid this. Then uh, look for adverse effects, uh, check for over-the-counter medicines, beware of the drug allergies and sensitivities, you know, um, then... Uh, Review medication timings and administration to avoid these drug interactions. Iron and calcium, I gave you the example. Antacids and the uh, antibiotics, these are the common ones which we use. So, uh, review their timings, uh, how are they being taken, and encourage medication adherence. Very often, you know, we blame uh, the quality of the drug uh, that uh, or the generic drugs are not effective like that, but uh, the base basic uh, root cause for no response is that the patient is not taking the medicines as prescribed uh, or the timings are not perfect. There is a drug interaction taking place. So, stay updated, assess the pro patient's profile, communicate with the patient. You need to inform, you know, especially the elderly patients, they get confused whenever a brand name is changed. You know, the, your supply in the hospital changes. So, they often recognize these drugs by their appearance. Uh, the color, size, etc. So, um, uh, monitor these patients clo closely and remember a uh, problem arises when an interacting drug is added to a previously stable regimen. So, there are many websites available. You may note down this. Uh, nowadays, each one of have um, smartphones. Uh, you can search this. Uh, you can type in the name of the drugs and these sites will provide you the interaction whether this is major interaction or a minor interaction and how to administer these drugs together. So, these are important websites you can refer uh, to this. So, of course, uh, uh, when we have to write a prescription, we need to close the gaps here. Uh, as I, I think you've seen this slide uh, a number of times now, but I think this slide is still, you know, very, very relevant. Every day is relevant because because we need to reduce the uh, uh, clinical practice variation. We need to keep in mind that our first principle is 
first to do no harm to the patient. And many of these harms can be caused by interactions, by, you know, uh, you know, unnoticed adverse drug reactions. And if you want quality improvement, we need to follow uh, the standard uh, treatments and we need to keep this in mind. Uh, so uh, standard treatment guideline, I would come back to this is a one uh, is a concept that will help you in prescribing safely for your patient because somebody the experts have already gone into these details and that's how they have decided uh, the regimen uh, for the patient uh, the best of these and uh, these guidelines uh, you know tell you uh, you know uh, caution you uh, about the adverse drug reactions, their monitoring, uh, the interactions which may be taking place. I don't know how, if you have this book, uh, you know, there is a, uh, you know, appendix to this uh, um, uh, book on drug interaction, clinically relevant drug interaction. You know, otherwise this is a very exhaustive, uh, uh, you, you know, um, interactions are exhaustive, you know, and number of exhaustion uh, interactions may be there, but what, whatever is clinically re relevant have been given. Adverse drug reaction, how do you minimize adverse drug reaction? Is There is another uh, annexure. How do you prescribe uh, in liver disease, uh, kidney disease uh, and in pregnancy uh, all those annexures are given in this book so you may uh, go through this uh, you know that will help you in prescribing uh, medicine safely uh, to this and uh, of course uh, uh, the uh, you know the unique feature is that it provides you non pharmacological uh, ways of treating because hypertension if you want to treat and if you don't instruct the patient on uh, salt intake or uh, you know diabetic patient if you don't instruct on the diet uh, you know the whole treatment would be uh, wasted so uh, and then we also need to know uh, the assessment of response to therapy how does it happen when do you have to do it how often do you have to check the blood pressure how often uh, should you change the dosage you know in hypertension uh, i have seen people increasing the dose uh, frequently uh, within 3 4 days time 7 days time they will uh, add another drug or double the dose whereas we know the peak effect peak antihypertensive effect would be seen uh, maybe more than three weeks so uh, such uh, you know rapid uh, dose escalations are not advised so likewise there are uh, you know many other uh, safety points that we need to keep in mind uh, when we are prescribing i think that's you know brings me to the end of the uh, my presentation. If there are any questions, uh, you can post them here in the chat box. Uh, you will all get a YouTube link uh, for this uh, session. Uh, so you can go through this. Uh, Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, uh. If there are any questions, uh, uh was it too difficult? <laughs> I see, <laughs> don't. Uh, has Dr. Amit joined? Um, I'm sorry, he's joining now, ma'am. He said he joined by 4 5. Okay. Okay, meanwhile, I can take. Uh, uh, Ayurvedic, okay, how to mitigate the interactions with Ayurvedic medicines? Uh, of course, you know, for, uh, the first point is that you elicit uh, this history and make it, uh, you know, clear to the patient. Many of uh, the patients have this belief that this Ayurvedic, Herbal, Yunani uh, medicines are harmless, which may not be true because like uh, with modern medicines, they also have 
the minimum dose, maximum dose defined uh, for this. And uh, sometimes, uh, uh, you know, because uh, uh, the preparation is not good, the quality of these medicines is not good because in herbal uh, medicine, the uh, plant, the uh, particular part of the plant, the way it is extracted, the way it is, you know, formulated, all uh, these things make a difference. So you need to, I think, I'm not discouraging the use of Ayurvedic medicines, but be careful, elicit this history because patients on their own do may not tell you that they are uh, taking Ayurvedic. Because they think uh, our doctor annoy ho jayega, uh, if I tell them that besides modern medicine, I'm also taking Ayurvedic medicines. So it, they may not be forthcoming uh, with this. Uh, so only ways, uh, if you find that any patient is getting this, so you may check on, you know, if there, is there any possible um, interaction taking place between and warn the patient about the same. And if required, you need to uh, adjust the dosage. Uh, website, uh, uh, you know, uh, okay, let me show you the. Just a minute. Oh, why is it not coming? Ah, uh, this is the one. Drugs dot com, drug interaction dot com. Uh, you know, uh, nowadays I, uh, you know, you can just uh, type your query. The uh, what is the interaction between drug so and so drug and and it will you know uh, pop up. Uh, but these are the specific uh, softwares uh, where you can add, uh, you know, uh, add in the, uh, some softwares take up to four drugs, five drugs, six drugs. Some would require you to sign in. So depending on, you know, your interest, uh, uh, some of them offer free, uh, but those uh, free services available for limited uh, four or five different combinations. So, uh, types of drugs it can be any but if uh, for example patient is taking more than six so perhaps you may not uh, you know get uh, without signing in so uh, but these are very useful sites you know whenever i get into trouble you know for example we had uh, some patient here in my hospital and he was on a very re a resistant uh, case uh, and was on multiple uh, medicines uh, uh, from different classes and still the patient was not responding because he was receiving high dose of antipsychotics. So it was imperative that they had put the patient on anticholinergic triaxiphenidyl. And, you know, when I checked on the interaction, you know, uh, you know, that itself was causing, um, uh, you know, was responsible for no response. So I told them to reduce the dose of uh, the anticholinergic drug and then the patient uh, improved so uh, and you know one way of knowing this is uh, these sites uh, you know uh, that will tell you the yes uh, you are right a major is found in theory uh, uh, major drug interaction is found in theory, not patient, uh, is not affected or no change clinically. How do we deal with this? See, as I told you, there are three outcomes. Uh, uh, either it can uh, lead to harmful effects or no clinical significance, or you may use it for your benefit. Majority fall into this category of no clinical significance. But the examples that I gave you, were of the harmful effects, you know, that may arise with certain groups of medicines. So you have to be careful with those medicines when you are prescribing, uh, you know, you need not worry about uh, the minor interaction taking place that because they may not alter the response. Uh, I think that answers uh, the question, but be careful, you know, uh, at least, you know, uh, being careful is, uh, you know, 
not bad uh, whenever you are adding uh, changing the treatment at that time you have to closely monitor so what is happening to the response it is uh, because you know many a times we don't understand this and we keep add another that prescribing cascade uh, may happen uh, that you add another drug for that uh, which may not be warranted if you take care of the interaction Any other questions? Ah, uh, I think the topic was difficult or was it too dry? Mm -hmm. Many of us get scared, you know, uh, uh, by these drug interaction, but I hope uh, now you have understood the logic. Uh, there are few sets of, you know, where the interactions are known. If you familiarize yourself with these interactions, uh, that will, uh, you know, uh, lead to uh, safe uh, prescribing. The standard treatment guidelines will help you in do the, doing that uh, prescription. You know, uh, let me just sum summarize. You know uh, what we had been talking about. Uh, one thing is that you avoid irrationality. Uh, drugs with known efficacy, safety, uh, you know, uh, cost effectiveness only should be prescribed. Uh, drugs uh, which uh, you know. Uh, if you are comparing now, there are several drugs which are available in the market uh, from the, you know, even in, uh, for example, painkillers, there are so many painkillers now available. So whenever we are saying that you have to evaluate drug on efficacy, safety, suitability and cost, this is we are talking about on the basis of relative efficacy, relative safety, su suitability amongst those uh, class of the drugs uh, and out of all the four criteria efficacy the uh, the drug should be efficacious i still see uh, in many of the uh, essential medicines list we find seratio peptidase is there uh, many people uh, you know whenever there is an injury case they will prescribe seratio peptidase uh, but i haven't seen uh, the, the evidence in support of it but just it's just uh, happening uh, because of our past experience you know we've been using it and we you know ascribe uh, the response to a patient to this drug so you will find this ratio of peptidase in various uh, combinations nowadays various digestive enzymes are also available in the market so again uh, these digestive enzymes may have interaction so uh, and a patient may not consider this as an, uh, a drug and may not mention to you. So careful history taking is very important. And uh, safety, of course, we need to balance the benefit and the risk. Uh, the benefits should outweigh the risk. Uh, sometimes you may have to take some risk also tolerate, but remember uh, the principle of first do no harm if you cannot help the patient do not harm the patient so look for the irrationality look for you know uh, any possible adverse drug reactions uh, that may uh, you know be adding discomfort or harm to the patient can you uh, minimize them Although you cannot prevent all the adverse drug reactions, but by early recognition, you can minimize, you can re reduce the dose, you can change the timing, uh, you can see if the uh, if there is any potential uh, interaction, uh, any potential uh, po uh, potentiating agent is there in the prescription, can avoid and reduce these adverse. Then uh, the errors part. Uh, the prescribing errors, you know, we should not be prescribing, uh, you know, drugs, uh, uh, you know, uh, which are incompatible or having opposite effects or, uh, you know, uh, duplication is done. You know, we are 
many times very fond of uh, prescribing uh, by fixed dose, uh, fixed drug combinations. Uh, you know, all this is happening in the name of uh, uh, improving uh, compliance. Uh, or the reducing the number of pills to be taken uh, by the patient. Uh, but, you know, many times I've seen uh, prescribers do not know all the contents of these FDCs. If they know the contents, you know, perhaps uh, duplication would be avoided. Okay, I have uh, Dr. Amit Gupta joining here. Uh, welcome, Dr. Amit Gupta. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. <laughs> Okay, we were just having a discussion on the first session. Uh, today I was talking about drug interactions. Okay. Great. Thank you, uh, yeah. uh, thank you for your wonderful session uh, on the prescription safety checkup work and also the drug interaction even included the Ayurvedic drugs also. It is so uh, good session. Uh, now we are moving to the next session. I welcome Dr. Amit Gupta, Professor and Head Department of Surgery, AIMS New Delhi, uh, to take the session on the essentials management of free trauma do's and uh, don'ts for effective care. Uh, sir, he is a professor and head at the Department of Surgery at Trauma Surgical Critical Care Division, Trauma Center, uh, All India Institute of Medical Science, New Delhi. Also a fellow at Royal College of Surgeons from Glasgow and American College of Surgeons. He, sir, is also a chairman of Asian Collaboration for Trauma and Academy of Asian Collaboration for Trauma and also a national coordinator, faculty and director for Advanced Trauma Life Support India. Sir is also an executive member of Indian Society for Trauma and Acute Care. So I request you to take the session on uh, uh, trauma management over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Annapurna, for uh, that kind introduction. I'm trying to share my slides. Uh, am I, are my slides visible now? Yes. 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 Great. Uh, so dear participants, uh, a very good afternoon and uh, uh, welcome to the session on uh, essentials of trauma management and um, I believe that many of you are working in uh, uh, the Delhi government district hospitals and the other uh, hospitals. So I would be uh, before actually I, I go into the foray of uh, telling you about the in-hospital management of uh, the injured patients, a little bit of background about uh, the trauma management as such in India and uh, why um, you need to be uh, cognizant of the fact that the injured patient who's coming to your hospital or your dispensary needs to be taken care of really well because we would save a lot of lives and limbs which are lost unnecessarily to the menace of trauma. Uh, well, uh, it is actually known as the neglected disease of modern society because uh, injury has been taken care, uh, taken toll of uh, unnecessary lives. It's not that uh, injury did not happen earlier. In fact, uh, injuries are as old as uh, probably humankind is. Uh, initially, we were fighting nature. Uh, then we started fighting each other in wars. Uh, so injury has been there from times immemorial, but it's only recently that we actually started counting on lives as socioeconomic resources. Uh, and uh, lives are precious, definitely, both monetarily and, and as resources for the society. And at the same time, I would like to say that uh, most of the injuries, you know, whether they are accidental or whether they are man-made or whatever are 100 percent preventable and therefore the who has stopped calling accidents as accidents especially the road traffic accidents so it is very common for all of us to refer to road traffic injuries as road traffic accidents because who says but who says that because it's a disease and it is preventable you should not call them accidents it's it, it, they are actually man-made and therefore uh, you should call them road traffic injuries. In any case, injury is the third leading cause of uh, uh, disability adjusted life years lost. And at the same time, it's a, it's, a, it's a disease with a very, very high mortality in the first hour of occurrence of uh, this problem. And therefore, we need to do something as doctors in that first hour or loosely referred to as golden hour uh, to these trauma victims so that they uh, are taken care of well. 
Well, uh, roads and road traffic injuries in India have been taking at least 150,000 lives on our roads itself. Uh, number of injured are nearly 5 lakh. So you can see the number of patients who are being brought to our trauma centers and other hospitals um, every hour or every uh, you know sort of moment which is happening. In addition to that, our economy takes about 3% GDP hit just because of road traffic injuries. And I'll tell you that road traffic injuries are not the only injuries which are brought to any hospital. There are many, many other injuries which are brought. In addition to that, what I wanted to say, tell you is that this 1.5 lakh patients dying on Indian roads is grossly underestimation and underreporting. Uh, many of the epidemiological studies, including the million death study, projected that the NCRB data, that means the National Crime Records Bureau or the police data by which we have come to this conclusion of 150,000 deaths, is grossly underreported by at least 47 to 64 percent. That means the actual injury burden is around 250 lakh deaths on roads itself uh, in each and every year. And that's really, really very high. The other thing is that the top mortality are in only 13 states and out of that 50% are in the bigger states of this country, which is Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan, Karnataka, Maharashtra, Tamil Nadu, Uttar Pradesh. But again, if you see the population density, even Delhi has got its fair amount of share of both trauma mortalities as well as the people getting injured and disabled after having uh, these injuries. Uh, these injuries. Um, again, there are a bit of non-fatal injuries. Non-fatal injuries are those injuries which finally reach the hospital. Now, one of the studies from India itself uh, by Guru Raj from Nimhans uh, said that each death corresponds to roughly 35 seriously injured patients. Seriously injured patients mean they will not be able to reach the society back normally. They will have some amount of disability or the other. And about 100 so-called minor injuries and you can imagine a person who is a daily wage worker even having a small fracture of his hand and not working for the next month or so what will happen to his family so there's a tremendous economic burden attached to injuries and therefore we as doctors should do our best to actually save the lives and limbs which are lost our study itself showed that about uh, only 45 to 55 percent are transport related injuries rest of them fall in the category of non transport related injuries that means falls which are common in pediatric and old age people workplace trauma agricultural related trauma uh, firearms intentional self harms that means suicides uh, and other uh, issues like natural disasters and other things so there are other causes of injuries uh, not only road traffic injury so the death and the disability is much, much more higher than is projected in road traffic data. Well, what do we do? The problem with injury or, 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 or trauma is that uh, there is a very, very high mortality and morbidity rate. So if I have an injury in India and if I have an injury in, uh, say, in US or Australia where the trauma systems are developed, uh, I am 16 times more likely to die in India as compared to the West. And the reason for that is that we do not have systems of care in trauma. Now, the systems of, of care in trauma are complex systems. They are unlike the other healthcare delivery systems where uh, if you have an elective problem like a gallstone or a hernia or even a, uh, even a cancer, you are free to choose your hospital, your doctor, the place where you want to go at your will, at your ease. Unfortunately, the injured patients on the roadside do not have that option. Now, if they are injured, there is a set of people who would take them to the hospital, an ambulance service, but more often the bystanders and the relatives or the police is taking uh, the patients to the hospital. That's what our data shows. Inside the hospital, there is a different team in the emergency room, which is treating the same patient. Then after that, a different team which is operating on that and different team which is taking care in the ICU. And then finally, if the patient survives, a different team which is taking care of the rehabilitation. 
So you can see it's a very complex time dependent system uh, which has to be in place so that we can reduce the mortality and morbidity of the patients. Remember, whenever a trauma patient arrives in your emergency department, it is a time sensitive disease. Please start ticking the clock in your minds right from the time the patient arrives. Otherwise, the patient might die right there. So whenever we look at trauma care systems, there are three pillars, basic pillars, the pre-hospital care, which is the uh, before the hospital, which is generally how the patient is brought to the hospital. The in-hospital care is divided into two paradigms, the acute care, which is happening in the emergency department and the definitive care, which is happening in either the operating rooms, ICU or ward. And then finally, the post-hospital care. But whenever we see or critically analyze a system, we should do it in terms of physical resources, human resources and the processes of care. Now, the physical resources and the human resources are certainly not in the hands of the doctors who are working there. Maybe when they become policy makers on, or when they become administrators, they can affect that. But generally, the processes of care or the processes of treatment are the ones which are in the hands of the healthcare professionals and therefore, uh, we should do our best to improve the processes of care, uh, these processes of care uh, in an injured, injured victim within our hospital. Now, the system again says that it is from resuscitation to rehabilitation, right? So, hospital plays just a one part in the whole system of the chain of events. It is not system. So, you cannot equate a hospital to a trauma system. So, no matter how great a hospital like the Apex Trauma Center where I work might be, but the outcome of the patients would definitely be dependent on the other aspects like the pre-hospital care or the post-hospital care. So they, it, it has to be looked, but our job is to do our work as best as possible in the uh, given scenario or in the given hospital. The pre-hospital care, we all know India lives in two centuries simultaneously. On one hand, on the roads, we see very swanky ambulances with uh, all the provisions of monitoring, maybe ventilation also. But at the same time, so on the left hand side of your screen, are real shots from India, just about 70 to 80 kilometers from the capital, wherein the trauma patients are being brought very, very adversely. In fact, this kind of transport will affect them very adversely and their outcomes very adversely. So there is a definite gap uh, in the trauma care system. And therefore, uh, we see that in rural and semi-urban areas, the infrastructure and the trained manpower itself uh, is uh, uh, is missing, uh, but in the, uh, I, I would say urban areas, it is still present, but you can see the organization or the processes of care are actually absent throughout, throughout. And so is the data generation. We do not have any registries for trauma separately, like a cancer registry. We do not have the outcomes being studied and therefore we cannot do any improvement beyond that. Although there are a lot of efforts now being made after the trauma center at Ames has opened up in the past 15 to 20 years, uh, which is not the purview of my talk, but but I would just suggest that uh, you can uh, read a paper on trauma systems in India. Well, uh, let us come to the in-hospital trauma care. As I said, it is divided into acute care, which happens in the emergency department, where our casualty medical officers or our medical officers or the residents are working and the definitive care, which happens in either the operating room, ICUs or wards, and finally the acute rehabilitation or physiotherapy of the patients in the hospital. Now, the primary aim of the hospital is, as and when the patient is brought, to save as many lives and limbs as possible, right? That's our primary goal uh, in treating trauma patients. At the same time, there are different levels of care in trauma, which are slightly different from other healthcare uh, sort of systems. What we say in trauma, the level one care is not the lowest, it's the highest level of care. And that's an internationally accepted norm. That the level one means the top level trauma center, which has got all the re human resources and the infrastructure, which is dedicated to trauma care, right? Level two is something like a district hospital or a medical college hospital or a university medical college hospital which does not have a 24 seven neurosurgery or which does not have a teaching program uh, inside their hospitals, they can be labeled as 
level two centers. Level three would be something like a CHC or a smaller dispensary, which does not have 24 seven access to care. It can take care of the injured patients in the morning, but not in the night. And level four services are just smaller nursing homes and, and smaller place where resuscitation can happen. And then after that, patient can be shifted or transferred to a higher level of care. Well, we also know, and this graph you must have seen in Love and Bailey uh, also, there's a trimodal pattern of death in trauma. That means there would be certain deaths which will be happening instantaneously after the incident has taken place. Then there are certain deaths which occur in the first few hours, say about uh, hour one to hour six or hour five. These are known as early deaths. And finally, there would be deaths in weeks or the late deaths which are resultant from, uh, say, sepsis or multiple organ failure. Now, as you can see, there is very little which we as doctors can do in the first peak. And the first peak can be reduced only by injury prevention methods like enforcing laws, like voluntarily doing things like wearing helmets, seat belts, not talking on phone, not drinking and driving, obeying speed limits. Now, all these things are mandated by the WHO as enforcement rules and therefore should be adhered to. So our role as doctors is to inform the general public, go to the public and inform them about road safety. Only then the first peak can come down. Mainly our issue is early death where the treatment helps and quick treatment helps definitely. So this is the time that the patient reaches the hospital and that is why please turn the first hour of care within your hospital as the golden hour. It's not necessary that all patients might arrive within an hour because our pre-hospital systems are not that good. But whenever the patient arrives, please make that point of time and the one hour within that as the golden hour of your hospital. Well, trauma care, as I said, there's a chain of survival and therefore it is a team effort. Now, within a hospital also, it should be a team, generally, uh, including people who are working um, uh, simultaneously on the same patient. But if it is not there, then you should work vertically. That's what we know as horizontal resuscitation or team resuscitation. But even if a single person along with some help is there, you could still do a resuscitation ABCD way or in a vertical manner. Right. So a trauma team generally is an organized cohesive team. It is properly trained. It speaks the same language. That's very, very important. So what I'm going to tell you in the next few slides is the common language of trauma or the initial management of trauma. And that it comes from the advanced trauma life support course. And that is nothing but the ABCD of trauma care. So everybody needs to be on the same page. And everybody needs to actually, uh, you know, say, speak the same language so as to avoid confusions uh, and also provide a competent leadership for trauma care. So common language is important. So that's what the, the common language is. It's known as the ABCDE of in-hospital acute trauma care. And here the ABCDE are slightly different from uh, the ABCs of cardiac arrest or the advanced cardiac life support. Here we assume that whosoever is coming in, wheeled in, is generally uh, surviving and the heart is beating. Obviously, if, if you find that the heart has, is not beating, you will start on the ACLS protocol of CPR breathing, CPR breathing. That's a, that's a different aspect. But generally, if the patient is conscious, you would continue to do what is known as the ATLS protocol or the ABCD of trauma. Now, our priority basically in trauma is the physiology. Now, there might be many injuries which are distracting to you. Something like a mangled extremity, something like some bowel coming out of the abdomen. Now, actually that is not killing the patient, but what is killing the patient is what is happening to his vitals. And therefore, the basic ABCD or the priority is primary survey. And therefore that is focused towards the patient's physiology and not the anatomy of the injury. Once the patient is stabilized, then you concentrate on the actual injuries and maybe call the surgeon or call anybody else who can mend that anatomy. So basically rapidly assess the physiology, do simultaneous resuscitation is the paradigm. So our objectives would be to understand the principles of primary and secondary assessments, 
that means what do you understand by primary assessment what do you understand by secondary assessment identify the management priorities perform appropriate resuscitation and monitoring procedures recognize the value of patient history and biomechanism of injury that's very very important now generally a handover of a patient whenever you take it either from a relative you should ask them at least three or four questions one is how did it happen what is the mechanism of injury because the patterns of injury which are produced by for example a two wheeler uh, injury uh, incident uh, or a or an uh, incident road traffic in injury happening on a two wheeler is very very different from the passenger of the car again it is very different from a person who has fallen from height so we need to ask the mechanism of injuries we need to ask the injuries if they have been identified any in the pre hospital or in the previous hospital we need to know the sci science at the scene that means the vital science and if at all any treatment was administered at the uh, before he arrives to your hospital so this is known as mist or mechanism injuries science and treatment history this is just what you want, need to know let us start with a case scenario a 44 year old male driver who crashed head on into a wall that means the transfer of injury is very very high Uh, the transfer of energy so basically trauma is nothing but transfer of high energy onto the human body in a very small time so any energy which is transmitted onto the human body will cause injury that means disruption of the bodily tissues uh, and that's what we term as injury or trauma now just see this patient who has had a crash head on into the wall he is unresponsive at the scene and he arrives at the pre uh, at the hospital with basic life support cervical collar stabbed on a backboard what is the sequence of priorities in assessing this patient now if if you generally take the normal priorities suddenly you would jump on to the conclusion that this patient is unresponsive he is unconscious so he has got head injury so let us get a ct scan done or let us call the neurosurgeon and you would forget any other resuscitative measure but remember that the priorities of care in a injured patients remain the same whatever the condition of the patient is when he is brought so do not jump and think that he has got a thoracic injury or he has got a head injury or a spinal injury please manage these patients in the right way right algorithm of management right now the first thing to do in a hospital and each and every hospital should at least have a basic triage in which you uh, in the emergency room where you finally decide which patients are going to the red area that means which are uh, very sick patients which can wait for some time that means yellow and which are walking wounded right so so basically uh, these are the three color codes in the hospital there is another color code black which means the patient is already dead when brought to the hospital and the patient goes to us uh, a waiting area or the mortuary now we at our trauma center have architecturally triage tri tri these areas we have a red area we have a yellow area and we have a green area separately so that these patients do not mix moreover because the red patients would require a lot of human care lot of healthcare workers uh, indulgence and therefore the the doctors and the staff should not be disturbed by the green patients and remember the green patients are walking wounded they would shout the most they would uh, create the most hassle therefore try to maintain a different area for a walking wounded patient than a red or a yellow area so that's how we do we triage the patients of compromised abc with any major injury or major mechanism of injury as red and we do the whole atls uh, protocol uh then yellow area stable abcds with major injury which require hospital admission or might require hospital admission go to the yellow area and then the green patients are minor injuries with stable abcd obviously first thing in the emergency department is use universal precautions a cap and a gown a glove is a must mask obviously nowadays after covid most of the hospitals would have mask also uh it depends upon the sterility of the area and your ed whether you want to wear shoe covers or face shields and things like that but basically a cap and a gown and glove are must so that's what the 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 priorities in any injured patients are 
rapidly assess the physiology of the patient. That means do the primary survey. Simultaneously, you start the resuscitation of vital functions. You continue to reevaluate. Once you feel that his primary survey or his physiology is returning to normal by your interventions or by your resuscitation, you go on to what is known as secondary survey. Now, secondary survey is a detailed examination of the patient trying to find out what all anatomical injuries this patient has got. Continue the reassessment. So, reassessment. So, these trauma patients are very dynamic patients. Today uh, or, or at this moment, if they are not unstable, it is not that they will un remain unstable only. They might go and become unstable because probably if they are bleeding in the abdomen or into the chest and you've not picked it up in the primary survey or it was not apparent there, it might happen later on in the course of the hospital. And therefore, it is always very, very important to continue the reevaluation and reassessment of these patients till the time you're sure that these patients are now stable, either to go for definitive treatment in the OR or the ICU, or if they are stable enough to be referred to any other higher center of care. That means transfer to definitive care. Now the summary is, as I said, primary survey, which means ABCD, and I'll tell you what ABCD means. Resuscitation, do the adjuncts. Adjuncts means monitoring devices and other things like urinary catheter, gastric tube uh, and some of the adjuncts, uh, radiological adjuncts, which you have to do to know the physiology of the, or what is probably affecting the physiology of the patient. That's known as adjuncts to primary survey. Continue resuscitation, reevaluate, and then if the patient is okay, go on to a detailed secondary survey. That means try to find out the anatomy of the injury. Do certain adjuncts like CT scans or any other special studies because now your patient is stable and can go to radiology uh, and then continue to reevaluate till the time the patient is transferred to a definitive care. So whether it is women, pregnant, pediatric, geriatric, or any other mechanism of injury, as I said, whether fall from height or, or gunshot injuries, the primary uh, priorities of primary survey, resuscitation, reevaluation, secondary survey, definitive care remain the same. They will not change. Now, how to assess very quickly the primary survey? That means the ABC of a patient. So, this is known as 10 second primary survey. So, simply identify yourself, ask the patient his or her name, ask the patient what happened. And if the patient is able to tell you some uh, tangibly tell you uh, uh, what what has happened and he can communicate that means a he's phonating that means he's got a patent airway b he has got appropriate air reserve for speech or phonation that means right now his breathing is also okay c means he has got good perfusion to his brain because that's the thing which goes first in hypoxia so the patient becomes uh, a combative, he becomes abusive, he becomes agitated. These are the first signs of hypoxia or circulatory failure uh, in a patient of trauma. So if he is talking normally, probably his circulation to brain is fine and he also has a clear sensorium that means he doesn't have any significant head injury for that moment. Remember that this patient is a dynamic patient, he may fall. So initial, this is a good triage tool or just asking and if the patient is, is, is fine, you can continue to monitor him in yellow area, uh, but the, if the patient is unresponsive or has any vital issues or issues in vital signs, then obviously he needs to go to the red area. Primary assessment, as I said, it is slightly different. The meaning of A, B, C, D, E is slightly different from ACLS or advanced cardiac life support. A in, uh, in um, uh, uh, trauma means airway always with cervical spine immobilization in line stabilization of sp cervical um, spine. B is breathing with adequate ventilation. C refers to circulation and hemorrhage control. Remember, if the person is bleeding from somewhere, you have to control it no matter however, howsoever blood or fluids you give. Finally, the answer lies in controlling the hemorrhage. And in D, after the ABCs have been stabilized, try to assess his sensorium. 
because now when the a and b and c are normal you need to know whether the patient has got head injury or not and this is called disability adjustment or brief neurological examination and finally you need to expose the patient completely but at the same time when you are exposing the patient completely exposure is necessary for for finding out missed injuries but at the same time trying trying to take control of the body temperature that means as soon as you disrobe him also start uh, or shut down your acs or start your warmers or quickly um, have the blankets on the patient now the primary assessment or primary survey is to identify the immediate life threatening injuries right identify physiological derangements which are happening only after this you proceed to a secondary survey not before that uh, always remember that let us come to airway with cervical spine control so as soon as the patient arrives you see that the airway uh, you see that the patient is unconscious or otherwise not responding <clears throat> try to maintain the inline stabilization of the neck look listen and feel for the airway uh, if his speech is hoarse <coughs> if the breathing is noisy uh, that means he has got some airway airway compromise look at obvious airway injuries to the neck look at the other injuries in the air upper airway like facio maxillary injuries uh, also look at uh, the deformity of the areas uh, and therefore uh, you need to you know sort of look listen and feel uh, feel for any crepitus any facial bone fractures any airway uh, problem in the neck uh, and therefore uh, you try to find out uh, whether or not this patient is having an airway issue or not uh, the next uh, what happens in airway is that uh, whether the airway can be actually um, patent so the airway can be only three things patent obstructed or threatened so if the patient is having sonorous noise if the patient is gurgling that means he has got obstructed airway you need to do something <clears throat> like suctioning or like intubating very quickly the airway also might be patent right now but threatened for example if the gcs of a patient is less than 8 that means he is having severe traumatic brain injury he cannot take control of his gag reflex and therefore these patients have to be uh, intubated or given a definitive airway so any skull base fracture oral bleeding ear bleeding which give you an idea that this patient might be having head injury needs intubation if they are unconscious obstructed airway obviously you need to suck out the blood and the secretions take care of the falling tongue and then again provide a definitive airway so how to maintain a airway you can maintain a airway by using a maneuver known as jaw thrust in a um, class like this i cannot actually demonstrate a jaw thrust but definitely you can go ahead and and see it in your manuals or do it in a course uh, then you clear away the foreign bodies by finger swipe or suctioning most common foreign uh, agent which is obstructing uh, is saliva or blood and the most common uh, thing which obstructs is tongue falling back in an unconscious patient so you initially insert the godel's airway start oxygen by mask and try to establish a definitive airway remember that if a oropharyngeal airway like a godel's airway is tolerated by a patient that means he doesn't have a gag reflex because normally if you insert a, a oropharyngeal airway into your mouth you cannot sustain that you will immediately try to gag it out uh, and but if the patient is there who is uh, maintaining a uh, oropharyngeal airway remember that he needs a intubation he needs a definitive airway now apart from endotracheal intubation if you cannot intubate and cannot ventilate the other way of doing it is a cricothyroidotomy now tracheostomy is never used as a emergency procedure remember a surgical airway uh, is done by simply cutting the skin on the thyroid membrane uh, which is a membrane between the thyroid cartilage and it can be easily felt uh, by you yourself if you if you palpate the neck uh, it's a gap between the thyroid and the uh, uh, and the cricoid and that's known as cricothyroid membrane and you just rupture it and you enter the trachea and insert the uh, airway that's the simplest way 
Coming on to breathing again, look, listen, feel at the area between the chin and the abdomen, that is umbilicus. All that comprises of the breathing area or the thoracic wall. Now, look at the rate and depth of respiration. See for any engorged neck vein, tracheal deviation. All these would be uh, contributing significantly to your clinical examination of thoracic injuries. Also, listen to the chest bilaterally and feel for any hyperresonance by percussion or any crepitus of any rib fracture. So this is the way you assess for breathing. Uh, again, if there is a chest injury, if there is a change of voice, remember that this might be a laryngotracheobronchial injury and you need to intubate this patient very fast in the resuscitation phase. <coughs> if there are absent breath sounds with hyper-resonant uh, you know, sort of percussion, there might be a tension pneumothorax. Now, tension pneumothorax is a reality. You should diagnose it clinically and you should insert a needle or your finger in the fifth intercostal space in the just anterior to mid clavicular. Wherever you do your ICD, that should be the point you should insert the needle to decompress the pressure which is being created in the thorax. If it is dull to percussion, there might be a possibility of massive hemothorax. Put in a chest tube. If there is a large amount of blood, you can later on slightly clamp it and send it to uh, any other hospital. But generally, if the tube is kept open and the blood is drained out from the thoracic cavity, the lungs will expand and the bleeding will stop. A collapsed lung, uh, lung always bleeds, but an expanded lung does not bleed. Remember that. If there is a chest wall defect and there is an open pneumothorax, you can seal it from three sides or you can close it and do a ICD drainage if you are in a hospital. If there are paradoxical movements, you might have a flail chest at hand. And the best if you cannot manage a flail chest is to just provide them adequate oxygenation, prevent hypotension and send them to a higher level of care. Again, same for if there are muffled heart sounds, there might be a cardiac tamponade. Quickly assess if you have an ultrasound, just do a pericardial window. If you do not have an ultrasound and you feel that this patient has a cardiac tamponade, again, prevent hypotension, prevent hypoxia, do the ABCs and send this patient to uh, a higher level of care. So that's what I said. Management of breathing is administer oxygen, oxygen, oxygen. These patients are oxygen deficient and therefore oxygen is the treatment of any trauma patient, the first treatment. For tension pneumothorax, as I said, needle thoracostomy in the fifth ICS, seal the open pneumothorax, prepare for a chest tube and ventilate with a bag mask if you do not know how to intubate. But every doctor should know how to intubate because that's life-saving procedure. Circulation. You assess shock as soon as the patient enters your uh, emergency room, right? Shock is nothing but a state of inadequate tissue perfusion uh, leading to tissue hypoxia. So it has got nothing to do with blood pressures, right? Blood pressure are, uh, or a decrease in blood pressure as a, are as a result of, of all this happening or loss of blood. And in trauma, remember, hemorrhagic shock is there until and unless proven otherwise. In trauma, other types of shocks can occur like obstructive shock, uh, Tension pneumothorax and cardiac tamponade, I told you, should be identified at the level of B itself, right? Not at the level of C. We are discussing C now. So basically, it can be obstructive. It can be distributive, like, like neurogenic or septic shock, which will happen, happen later on, or cardiogenic shock because of direct cardiac injury. But you have to rule out hemorrhagic shock. That means if the patient is bleeding from somewhere or not, until it's proven otherwise in a trauma patient. Uh, is the patient is in hemorrhagic shock? Well, the first thing which happens in class 1 shock or 15% of blood loss is alternation of level of consciousness. As I said, brain is very sensitive to hypoxia. So the first sign which happens of shock is alteration in level of consciousness. So do not attribute the alternation in level of consciousness to head injury always. Your patient might be hypoxic and merely giving him uh, good ventilation, good oxygenation can actually improve the patient. The next sign which appears is cold diaphoretic thin. The patient's 
heart rate will begin to uh, rise and his breath rates will begin to rise when his blood loss is of the level of class 2 hemorrhagic shock or 15 to 30 percentage of uh, percentage of blood volume which is roughly 750 to 1500 ml now the hypotension that's why i was saying do not rely on hypotension for diagnosis of shock because hypotension generally occurs or decrease in systolic blood pressure would occur only in class 3 hemorrhagic shock when the person has already lost one and a half to two liters of blood so you can see there are early signs of hemorrhage much much before hypotension starts uh, showing itself so any patient remember who is hypotensive when he when he reaches you your your emergency has already lost 1.5 liters of blood you should be uh, uh, really you know sort of on the whole uh, uh, very active in finding out from where this patient is bleeding from and finally um, decreased urine output will occur because the systems will start failing um, now there are only five sites of bleeding in trauma uh, from where a person can bleed to death from try to identify those sources of bleeding one is external one uh, that means blood on the floor one on the floor and four more what are those four four are the bigger cavities of the uh, of the human body which is chest abdomen pelvis along with the retroperitoneum because most of the pelvic bleeds would, would bleed into the retroperitoneum and finally the muscle compartment or the long bones that means fracture of the humerus so all these can can actually bleed you till class 4 hemorrhagic shock you need to do something so what you can do in the emergency room for shock one is obviously hemostatic resuscitation but more than that if your patient is bleeding and the bleeding is apparent please apply direct pressure or tourniquet tourniquet is the last resort in pre-hospital setting but in the hospital direct pressure with a compression bandage will do in order to reduce bleeding from pelvis you have to do what is known as pelvic binder you have to uh, uh, apply a pelvic binder uh, later on you can use hemostatic agents like tranexamic acid which is now a part and parcel of trauma management uh, you have to splint the fractures because free fractures moving fractures will bleed more than splinted fractures so for fractures you can splint and then finally uh, you have to control bleeding or stop the bleeding and that may require a surgery if you have a surgeon at hand then obviously it is good you can uh, directly shift the patient to the OR. If you do not have a surgeon, do all these things. Pressure, uh, reduction in pelvis volume, that is pelvic binding, uh, start the resuscitation, start hemostatic agents, splint the fractures, and then consider for transfer to other. Now, fluid resuscitation, what fluid to give? Isotonic crystalloids. So if you have Ringer's lactate, that's the best. If you do not have Ringer's lactate, then normal saline. There is no role of colloids, either plasma or dextran or heta starch or whatever uh, hemaxyl in emergency, right? So no plasma expanders in emergency, only crystalloids. Blood should be ready. That means you should have sent the blood for grouping and cross matching. If you feel that your hospital does not have a blood bank, or, or O negative blood is also not available, then probably you might just pack the patient and send him uh, ahead. But again, uh, you should be able to access the veins by two large bore IV cannula, which is uh, 16 gauge or more, that is 16 or 14 gauge, orange cannulas or gray cannulas, nothing less than that. Uh, the type of uh, uh, vascular access generally would be anticubital veins in your forearm uh, the volume is generally the first load is given is one liter uh, of crystalloids and by that time if the blood and blood products are not available reassess the patient if he's improving then it's good if he's not improving uh, that means you'll have to uh, uh, give him more crystalloids and and start transferring the patient then the resuscitation should be balanced that means as i said blood and blood products should be there you monitor the response and prevent hypothermia. So consequence of any ABC problem finally is the triangle of death. Now the triangle of death in trauma patient is 
uh, acidosis, coagulopathy, and hypothermia. So what is happening when the perfusion to the tissues is not happening is that the whole cycle is going on to the anaerobic side. So basically, your whole physiology is going from aerobic uh, physiology to anaerobic physiology. And we all know that the end product of anaerobic physiology is lactic acid or lactate. That is causing the acidosis. Acidosis further causes the cell damage and the tissue damage because our cells function at a very narrow pH. Uh, this is augmented by hypothermia. Uh, and same time, coagulopathy happens because of the hypoxia which is happening. So finally, the consequence of ABC problem is triangle of death, that is acidosis, coagulopathy, and hypothermia. After you manage the C, you start on the brief neurological examination, and that is nothing but calculate the Glasgow Coma score, which is nothing but a bridge score. We have all read it. E, V, M, best eye opening, best verbal response, and best motor response. That means if the patient is obeying commands, he is principally M6 or he is GCS15, right? Also assess the pupils frequently. Now, on the basis of Glasgow Coma score, the head injury is divided into mild, that means GCS of 14 and 15, moderate GCS between 9 and 13, and mild, that means, uh, uh, sorry, uh, moderate and severe. Severe means less than 9, that means 8 and below. All severe traumatic brain injuries have a, a, a chance of going into secondary brain damage. That means even if they have local injury like contusions, or EDH or SDH, if hypoxia is not prevented or hypotension is not prevented, the whole head injury will, will become global. That means the head injury from local to become global and that's known as secondary brain damage. And you have to prevent hypoxia and hypotension. That means simply maintain your airway, breathing and circulation. That will prevent the secondary brain damage. Now, many of the times, I'm sorry, uh, this slide uh, is not there. So I'll just quickly tell you when to get the CT scan done. Now all patients, all patients remember of moderate and severe traumatic brain injury require a CT scan and a neurological uh, neurosurgical consult. So if you do not have, please do not go ahead and even do a CT scan, refer the patient, right? A uh, problem happens if there is mild traumatic brain injury or, or there is uh, the GCS is 14 to 15 that the patient is conscious or uh, is just drowsy right when to do that so if you have a history of loss of consciousness of more than five minutes if you have vomitings projectile vomitings if you have signs of base of skull fracture that means battle sign or raccoon eyes right uh, if your uh, uh, Neurological examination says that there is uh, some um, brief neurological issues like tingling and numbness of any side of the uh, body or if there is a localizing neurological sign. All these are indications that even in a conscious patient, you should get a CT scan done. Otherwise, these patients can be observed and they can be uh, discharged. So, but if there are these warning signs like loss of consciousness more than five minutes, like base of skull fracture signs, like uh, vomitings, like neurological deficits. Now, these are the patients who should get a CT scan and a neurosurgical evaluation. So that was from my side. Expose the patient completely, protect the patient from hypothermia. There are adjuncts to primary survey, which are just two x-rays and a fast. DPL nowadays is not done. No unstable patient should go to radiology. In fact, in trauma, there should be uh, x-rays and ultrasound in the emergency room itself. That means you should have a portable x-ray for chest and pelvis x-ray and an ultrasound machine for FAST, which is nothing but focus assessment or sonography in trauma. There's a different class for it. We can take it later on. Do a FAST with the ultrasound machine. Do two x-rays. That is more than sufficient to find out whether the physiology is happening because of chest injury, pelvis injury, or bleeding into the abdomen. Now, if you feel that your, your facility is not uh, able to cater to these needs, then use the time before transfer for resuscitation. 
do not delay transfer for diagnostic tests. So just do resuscitation, contact the referred hospital, tell them that this patient is coming and refer the patient. If your, uh, 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 your patient can be taken care of in your hospital or he's stable, he's, he's becoming stable, then you just take, uh, do the secondary survey, which includes brief relevant history and a detailed anatomical examination from head to toe. The history is known as ample history, Al uh, history of allergies, medications, past history, last meal and events. That means mechanism of injury. Uh, simply the, uh, these are uh, the important histories which have to be taken. And then a detailed head to toe, front to back examination of the whole body to find out what are the various anatomical injuries this patient has. As I said, continue to reevaluate, reevaluate, reevaluate. Why? Because there might be less severe injuries which you might miss in the emergency room or missed injuries or underlying medical problems. Therefore, have a high degree of suspicion and keep on reevaluating these trauma patients. Finally, if your patient is stable enough, you can send them to a CT scan. Uh, generally, it is a contrast enhanced CT scan of the torso. Uh, for head, it is non-contrast. Uh, CT scan, head and cervical spine, anything below that, that means thorax and abdomen value uh, cannot be there with any non-contrast CTs of the chest or abdomen. And therefore, only contrast enhanced CTs should be done for chest and abdomen for finding out various other problems. Uh, again, if the patient is unstable, he should not be shifted to the radiology. Medical legal documentation is important, so your record, uh, your record should have four C's. They should be clear, they should be concise. That means just write, I did the ABCD, these were the ABCDs. Uh, so we in the trauma center, in the primary survey or in the initial chart of the trauma management, even in medical legal case sheets, just have this. Uh, airway patent, not patent, whatever. So you uh, write what you did to the airway, breathing, circulation, disability, uh, and then you then you jot down what the injuries were, right? Uh, they should be clear, concise, as I said, chronological. Write the time always because I have been to many uh, disciplinary committees. The problem in trauma happens is if you don't write the time. Uh, so you should write the time and you should have consent for procedures. Now, consent does not necessarily mean consent of the patient or the relative. Now, if you feel as a doctor, two doctors can get together. If you feel that chest tube is important, don't even wait for a consent. It is an implied consent uh, because you are doing that procedure for saving a life. And then later on, you could jot down that this life-saving procedures was procedure was done to save the life of the patient, right? And the court will accept it. The only problem is that when we don't document, document everything which is happening and you will never go wrong even in a court of law. So to summarize, as I said, it is always primary survey, ABCD, resuscitation, reevaluation, uh, detailed secondary survey, and again, reevaluation. The primary survey is for finding out the physiology uh, derangements, that means immediate life threatening injuries, and the secondary survey is for potentially life threatening injuries or the anatomy of the injury. I'll end here. I think most of my talk about the initial assessment of management of trauma is done. Um, I'm sorry if I have uh, shot my overshot my time, but uh, that was the minimum I could have uh, done to do that. No, it was very much, you know, I was also listening to you. It's such a, this is such a huge topic. And to cover that, uh, the entire topic in such a, a short time uh, and uh, yet giving all the details uh, was really a, a tremendous task. And you've done this wonderfully. Uh, I hope uh, the participants also got their answers, you know, uh, you know, what to do and what not to do. I think he was very, very categoric, clear uh, in his presentation. Uh, what are the do's and don'ts, you know, uh, in the emergency department? Uh, still, uh, I will uh, invite uh, comments from the participants. If they have, uh, you can write it in the chat box. He would be happy to answer. Uh, the participants are uh, writing, uh, they found it very well explained. 
Uh, here there is a question, ma'am. Any fatal drug interaction and its management? I have already answered that in the uh, uh, chat box itself. Uh, I had mentioned th these fatal drug interactions in my presentation about um, uh, antidepressants, uh, uh, that serotonin syndrome, and then ACE inhibitors and uh, potassium sparing anti uh, diuretics. Uh, that can be lead to hyperkalemia. A knife had been uh, extended release preparation if crushed and given in uh, nasogastric tube can also lead to uh, life threatening um, hypotension and bradycardia, which can eventually lead to death. So there are many such examples. So these are st strict no no's uh, when you are administering these drugs. Okay, now uh, I think we have uh, some questions uh, about uh, uh, the trauma session. Uh, yeah, I think there is one question, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Surekha Kashyap is asking any scope for video recording in ED for MLC reasons. Now, uh, uh, there, uh, there, there, there is an issue about uh, video recording. Uh, so, our law uh, does not permit recording uh, by identification. So, if you can de-identify uh, the face or the body, you want to do it for what purpose? Uh, for medical legal, they would not accept uh, a video recording. But uh, for quality improvement, so we have been using this tool for quality improvement, but in that case, uh, you should have in your hospital a quality improvement team. This whole video recording should be done in camera. That means it, it should be only in front of the quality improvement uh, uh, committee, which we have in our trauma center and uh, no finger pointing uh, uh, in, in those video recordings. Just that why the process was wrong, uh, how the system can be improved. So if somebody is doing something wrong, it is not uh, up to us to uh, to blame him. Maybe he doesn't know it. Maybe he's not. So remediate him by giving him more classes. So that's the job of the quality improvement team. We have medical legal issues and that is why we do not record it. We record our simulation sessions, even for quality control. We do simulations in the ED itself and we record it and replay it and debrief. Uh, but live recordings, we started it once. But uh, we did not find it very useful because uh, again, there were medical legal issues, problems. Uh, yeah. One, one, one more question, sir. What about manitol in head injury with falling blood pressure and the patient is around 100 km from trauma center at the level of uh, secondary facility with no 24 into 7 OT? Okay, very nice question because I was expecting this question because uh, see, a role of any decongestant uh, in a head injury. Now, why do you want to give decongestants? 80 to 85 percent of the patients would not require any decongestant, uh, decongestant like mannitol upfront. I'll tell you why. So any patient who's all uh, who is having significant brain trauma like a EDH, and he is going into coning, who are the only patients who would benefit actually, or having significant brain edema, uh, which will be evident on anisocoria. That means if you see a unequal pu pupil and things like that. Uh, the role of mannitol is questionable because this patient might be hypotensive also. Now, if he is already hypotensive, giving mannitol can actually reduce the systolic blood pressure, which we do not want because that will make the head injury uh, into a global head injury, right? Further hypoxia. Uh, but again, at the same time, we do not want him to die of coning. So it's a double-edged sword. Generally, mannitol is used in centers where neurosurgeons are already available. Or as a temporizing measure, you very rightly said that if you do not have a neurosurgeon and you are sending this patient somewhere else and you are, are pretty convinced that this patient is actually coning or he has significant intracranial pressures which are raised, which are evident by low GCS, that means GC, severe traumatic brain injury and anisocoria, which, which you can calculate from D. D means GCS and uh, pupils or lateralizing signs. If you have lateralizing signs anywhere, that will give you an idea that this patient is actually coning. In that patient, is, you are justified to give mannitol. At the same time, also start crystalloids or blood and blood products and transfer the patient. I hope I have uh, uh, I have made it clear. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, then one more question is about how to decide the size of cervical collar used in trauma patient to stabilize the spine, maybe cervical spine. 
what what about that cervical uh, spine the uh, cervical collar size sir, to stabilize the uh, oh, spine trauma so generally you know these are uh, two types of collars are there uh, the classical philadelphia collar is having two parts one is for the occiput and the back side one is for the anterior part uh, it is velcro driven it's got three sizes small uh, pediatric small medium and large Generally, you will have to keep a set of uh, 5 to 10 collars in your ED every time so that it is actually dependent. The other type of collar which now we have started using is a, um, is a variable collar. So basically, uh, your, uh, your distance from the uh, angle of mandible right, to the, uh, the mid-clavicular uh, line or the mi mi middle of the clavicle is the distance basically which you require to stabilize the neck completely like this so it is now variable so now collars are available in which the length can be uh, varied and it can fit into the system so two types of collar are there okay uh, so one more regarding the medical legal uh, video covering during the uh, COVID time we have given the directions to take the video without the face covering so is it allowed so, uh, so COVID was a national emergency. Any decision taken for COVID was principally only for COVID. Expanding it uh, or extrapolating it to other diseases, especially trauma, where the legal issues are very, very high. So, all these cases are medical legal, except probably uh, some slip in the bathroom, like elderly and the, and they're themselves giving history. Most of these cases of hit and run or road traffic injuries or even fall from height, you never know whether he fell down himself or he was pushed. So all of them have got medical legal implications and therefore uh, generally we would not take videos here. Uh, there was one question about fast scan. Yeah. Okay. So fast is basically, so you know, uh, so these are point of care uh, uh, imaging um, investigations which are adjuncts to primary survey. Primary survey is ABCD. Now to find out why this ABCD is like deranged, uh, you have got adjuncts. So one is your monitor, SpO2 and things like that. The other one is imaging adjuncts. The imaging means only two x-rays, chest x-ray, pelvis x-ray, because these are sites of major hemorrhage. Now the other major site as, uh, which I told you of major hemorrhage was uh, belly or abdomen. Now FAST would just tell you, just keep the probe at four places, epigastrium for pericardial blood, right upper quadrant for blood in the hepatorenal pouch, left upper quadrant for, for blood in your splenorenal pouch and pelvis. Now these are the only four places in which you keep the probe and look for a dark shadow. If there is a dark shadow and your patient is unstable, after trauma it is considered to be blood and that means it is hemoperitoneum, right? So do not do anything else, call your surgeon, take him inside, just pack the abdomen or do whatever, splenectomy and all. Positive fast in an unstable patient is bad, right? But a positive fast, but a stable patient warrants a secondary survey adjunct, which is CT scan, right? Yeah. So your patient is now stable, everything is fine, but still his fast is positive. Maybe there, there might have been a bleed or there might be some bowel injury. So do a CT scan, you will find out. So fast is for unstable patients is the most sensitive. But if the fast is positive in a stable patient also, it gives you an idea that something is wrong in the abdomen. You need to further investigate the patient. I think, Dr. Uh, you were very well explained about the severe and the moderate injuries. I think uh, the gray area comes, you, you know, about the mild injuries, you know, especially the head injuries. You have uh, covered this in your presentation, uh, but most of the time you find that the patient comes and says, you know, uh, lost consciousness briefly or is little disoriented and had a vomiting once only. Uh, uh, GCS score is good, you know, it's more than 10 or 12, you know, what, what, you know, what investigations are required or what are the red flag signs here that we need to explain to the patients? Uh, I had actually mentioned it. Can I play the slide again? Because I had a slide, yeah, sure. I, I just uh, probably just a second. Uh, is my slides, are my slides visible? Yes, yes. Yes, it's visible. Okay, so basically the question is about CT scan of the of the head. Now, when to get a CT scan? Very clearly, all moderate and severe injuries would get a CT scan. The question arises when the patient is conscious. 
Now, if there is a pen history of penetrating injury, many a times bullet injury patients would come, you are suspecting that the bullet might have run through or whatever pellets might be there. Any penetrating injury to the head and face area should get a CT scan, ideally, right? Uh, when you suspect a skull fracture, that means if either there is a CSF, uh, uh, CSF otoria or rhinorrhea or blood from the nose, blood from ear or blood from the base of skull. These are signs of base of skull fracture. Again, these patients should get a CT scan even if the patient is conscious. Now, if the patient is having seizures, focal neurological signs, a retrograde immunity of more than 30 minutes, nothing less than that. If it is more than 30 minutes, uh, uh, that means loss of consciousness more than 30 minutes, severe headache or vomiting that to more than two episodes. These are current recommendations for getting CT scan in a otherwise normal uh, sensorium patient, ma'am. Right. So I think I've made myself clear. These are the actual current uh, guidelines and recommendations for getting CT scan. Uh, but, uh, you know, sometimes, you know, patients, ideally, I think these patients uh, should be observed for 24 hours, but sometimes patients are not ready to stay in the hospital. So what should be, you know, what uh, uh, instructions should be given to the patient uh, in such so a... Again, same instructions, ma'am. So same instructions. If you have any, uh, so A... Uh, and I'll tell you an incident. Uh, it's a very interesting incident because uh, that uh, happened uh, when our trauma center was just uh, opened up. And uh, uh, so there's, there was a uh, Delhi University student, I think, who had come with head injury. Uh, he was accompanied by uh, his friends, two or three friends. And when he came, uh, probably he was in the lucid interval or he was absolutely conscious. He was not having any problems. Uh, and uh, we kept him for about six to eight hours. And after that, in the ED, it was very crowded. So we, uh, so the 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 boys started saying that we have to go to the hostel and the hostel will close and things like that. So we gave him uh, them the flagging signs. So if you have seizures, if you have uh, vomiting, any other vomiting, if you have uh, any bleeding uh, further, or you have any any other dizziness, giddiness, whatever, you just come back. But unfortunately, what happened was that they went to the hostel, they were living in a hostel and the other friends went off to their own rooms. Now, what we now tell everybody is that somebody has to be there by his side 24 hours, at least for the next 24 hours to observe him, even if he's sleeping. Now, what happened to that boy was he was brought again to the emergency early in the morning, next morning, and he drowned in his own vomitus. Uh, he... He could not maintain his airway because he was unconscious. He vomited and the whole vomitus. So he was, he died of asphyxia or drowning rather than, I mean, of as, uh, aspiration rather than the head injury. So, uh, so these things do happen. They are reality. So I would suggest that if the patient is not able to be there for 24 hours under your observation is not agreeing, give him these, these warning signs, but at the same time also ensure that, uh, that he is not unaccompanied. So that's the key word, I think. Uh, during this observation period, what all, uh, you know, uh, parameters should be monitored for these patients? ABC, ma'am. So just a monitor to assess his uh, airway, whether he's breathing properly or not, whether his saturations are fine or not, respiratory rate is not going high, his pulse rate and or heart rate and blood pressure is okay. And finally, every, within the first 24 hours, every three hours at least, his GCS should be reassessed. Uh, uh, his GCS should be reassessed properly every three hours. So at least four to five times in 24 hours. I think Dr. Pankaj, uh, I hope it answers your question. Uh, this question was about if we encounter such patients with uh, LOC, projectile vomiting, battle signs and low BP, what could be the management? Role of dexamethasone in head injury? Uh, no. No role. No role. No role of steroids in spinal cord injury or only in very select few cases. So if you have a spinal cord injury, immobilize him and send to a center where neurosurgeon is there or a trauma surgeon is there. Um, they will take care of it. In the first six hours, it is said that methylprednisolone high dose, one single shot, uh, can be helpful. Uh, that to the the international nice guidelines uh, do not recommend it universally uh, and it should be monitored by a neurosurgeon or a trauma surgeon uh, 
uh, not to be given anywhere else. Dexamethasone is just out of uh, out of uh, not to be given. Any role of prophylactic uh, anti-epileptics? Uh, prophylactic anti-epileptics. If you've got a CT scan done, even if the patient is conscious and you're finding certain spots like contusions, uh, you have to start at least for nowadays. We don't give it for a very long time. We would give it for about uh, a month. Or at the most two months, and then we would discontinue it if there are no seizures. Uh, but only in those cases uh, cases in which there is some anatomical problem in the CT scan. If the C CT scan is clear, uh, no anti epileptics. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, any more questions? Uh, I think there was one question on how do you explain that uh, phrase that expanded lung bleeds less. Uh, uh, yes, there very was good one. question. So, so eighty five percent of all chest injuries can be treated merely by a chest tube. Why? Because it evacuates the air slash blood from the thoracic cavity and it allows the lung to expand. Now, if you see the anatomy of the lung, the arteries uh, and the veins or the blood vessels of the lung go along with the bronchi bronchus and the bronchioles till the end, till the alveolus. Now imagine a lung which is not inflated by air. Now it has got no pressure between the alveoli to block that, right? And hence, whenever there's a lung laceration in a, a collapsed lung, right? Then it will not stop bleeding. As soon as you inflate that, you give, uh, you vent out the blood or the air from the thoracic cavity and the lung expands. Now what happens is, as soon as the lung expands like a balloon, the smaller capillaries, arterioles will just will just seal off with that air pressure, with that air pressure. And that's why the bleeding stops. Obviously, if there's a, a bigger uh, bronchial vessel or a pulmonary artery, we can't do much. I mean, pulmonary artery bleeds will not even reach the hospital. Uh, so they will die probably on the way. There is a question about explain ICT insertion. Oh, ICD means intercostal tube drainage. Uh, the point at which the ICD should be inserted uh, is the fifth intercostal space, fourth or fifth it is said, but generally it is fifth only, uh, just anterior to the mid axillary line, about half an inch anterior to the mid axillary line. That's the triangle of safety, basically. Uh, safety means that neither the diaphragm is there in order to injure the diaphragm or the liver, nor the great vessels are there, nor any other uh, nerve is there. So basically that's referred to as triangle of safety. Uh, uh, that's the only point which is recommended by the ATLS to put in a chest tube. It should be at the upper border of the lower rib. Why upper border of the lower rib? Because that is, does not have the neurovascular bundle. Uh, so you, you give it a nick in this uh, skin after obviously giving a local anesthetic and all that stuff. Give a nick in the skin, put your artery forceps, just sound it on the rib and try to slope it on the upper border of the lower rib, right? That means if it is the fifth intercostal space, then the lower rib is sixth, right? So fifth intercostal space, you just put it and then just insert that artery forcep, open it and insert your finger and just insert the tube. It's very simple. It's a very, very simple procedure. For practicals, obviously you will have to come and uh, uh, attend the whole ATLS course. Um, or uh, any other trauma uh, these course. courses are available uh, do you, uh, regularly available yes ma'am they are uh, they can go on the website atls.in if anybody wants to do it's a two and a half day course okay uh, atls.in has got all the calendars everything everything is there okay. someone has also asked about the assessment case sheet uh, used by uh, your institute aims mm -hmm. yeah so again, you know, assessment case sheets, you can make your own. It should have all the necessary things which you have done uh, in the course of injured patients. And what we have done in our assessment case sheets is that uh, uh, there are emergency physician notes and the note starts with missed, uh, whatever you, history you got from transfer, right? Then the triage category, it says that the patient was triaged as red, yellow or green, right? And after that, there is what was the airway, breathing, circulation, and what you did on the other side is what you did for that airway, breathing, circulation. For example, the airway was threatened, they will write threatened and you say intubated or whatever. 
right? So you have this resuscitation and after that in the secondary survey, you have a detailed list of all the injuries. Like you used to make the old CMOs used to make a list of injuries. Now there was a uh, incised lacerated wound on the back, this size, this whatever, whatever you have uh, seen on the secondary survey. And then finally, uh, what treatment you have given and whom you have called. That is more than sufficient. So if you say that they uh, sent a call to the surgeon, you can just write the uh, the time that the call was sent to the surgeon at this time. Yeah. Uh, I think there's one more question. In case of road traffic accident and patients having zygomatic fracture, humerus fracture, nosebleed, altered sensorium, sequence of treatment uh, to be offered to such patients. Sequence of treatment remains the same. I, I, I've said so many times. Priorities are primary survey, ABCD, resuscitation, revaluation. Uh, once the patient is stabilized, secondary survey, adjuncts to secondary survey. So if he's got so simply your list is, uh, I'll just tell you, uh, zygomatic fracture uh, above is not going to obstruct the airway. So I'm not bothered about it, right? If any fracture is here, I would be bothered about my airway and try to intubate. Uh, humerus fracture will not cause that much of bleeding that it uh, only femur fractures can and pelvic fractures can cause that much of bleeding. I'm not bothered about humerus fracture. Nasal bleed, yes, I'm bothered about it because this patient might have a D problem. Altered sensorium, I'm very much bothered because it might be a A, B or C problem, right? So I'll try to assess the airway bleeding circulation, try to bring his sensorium up. If it still does not come, assess his sensorium after stabilization of ABC, which is D, which is GCS. If it is less, that means he is probably has head injury. So uh, get a CT according to that. That is the sequence of treatment. It never changes for any trauma patient. Any polytrauma patient. I think uh, this was very, very clear now, you know, what, what are the do's and don'ts? Uh, I think uh, it, I, there are no more questions. We can thank you, uh, you know, for sparing time from your busy yeah. schedule. He was traveling, uh, but still he found time uh, for this session. And I could not think of any better person than you. Thank you, you know, you so directly, much. you know, dealing with trauma uh, patients uh, and you receive so many uh, referral patients from other centers. So you exactly knew uh, where uh, is the problem, you know, what is it that is missing when the patient is transferred to AIMS and what all can be done uh, at the, uh, you know, lower level, you know, before you are arranging transfer, referral. I think one more moment if you can spend on referral letter, you know, what all should it have? You know, in my experience, I find uh, the referral letter given uh, while transferring the patient to a higher center is most of the time is inadequate. It does not provide the complete information. So what are the essential components of the referral? I think uh, the first thing in referral, uh... We always in ATL also take a lecture on transfer to definitive care. Uh, has to have uh, all the issues which I just listed as to how the patient came into your hospital with what history, uh, what was done prior to your hospital, what has been done in your hospitals as regards the resuscitation, that means primary and secondary survey, uh, chronologically, and what diagnosis you were able to come to. Right, not necessarily it is right, but from the whatever investigations, whether they're primary survey or you've done a CT scan or not, they should be completely written there, whatever the findings are. Also, how much time has elapsed from the primary injury to the time you are trying to refer the patient? Ideally, a phone call to a, a, a hospital would be beneficial for the hospital which is taking in the patient. Uh, we receive all sorts of transfers without basic things, but at least if a patient is having injury and you're suspecting a thoracic injury, insert a chest tube and then send. We still receive patients in a very bad condition who, in whom even a chest tube is not inserted. People are waiting in medical colleges for a CTVS surgeon to come and insert a chest tube. I mean, this is, or an anesthetist to come and intubate. I think these are MBBS level things, I think. This should come in the regular resuscitation uh, skill sets of any MBBS student. So please, if you if the patient is requiring intubation, do it and then send. Or if a patient is is requiring an ICD, please do it and send. A two uh, large bore IV cannula are a must. 
uh, if a patient collapses on the way, the ambulance person at least can uh, squeeze the bottles and put in some fluid. Uh, if the IV uh, cannulas are not there, they cannot even do that. So at least your ABC adjuncts or ABC things should be done. And only then the patient should be transferred. It should be mentioned what whatever has been done. Nothing more is required. Thank you, sir. Wonderful. <laughs> and learned, you know, so many things. Uh, you know, to, uh, although I am a pharmacologist, but I have interest in uh, clinical. So, uh, I think I would suggest the participants they should also attend uh, to this ATLS course. Yes. So that will, uh, you know, provide them, gives them hands-on experiences. You know, what to do and not to do. I think uh, with this, I would like to thank you, Doctor Amit, thank you, uh, for coming over, sparing time. And I would also like to thank my participants here for patiently being, uh, you know, listening to this session um, beyond two and a half hours. Many people say online sessions, you know, concentration, uh, uh, you can't have so much of concentration. So, but I think uh, uh, the participants, those especially who are returning for every session, they find it useful. Uh, and if it is of interest and if it upgrades upskills you uh, uh, anyone uh, would you know any mode would be as good you know whether online or physical so uh, with this uh, we thank everyone uh, annapurna dipika nhsrc dr shivastav uh, dr atul kotwal uh, for extending all these uh, you know uh, sessions uh, doing this seamlessly youtube uh, uh, you know recording would be available annapurna will be posting this after four or five days she needs that much of time so please be patient uh, for the youtube link uh, dr amit you can also access this uh, nhsrc has a youtube uh, you know uh, uh, um, patient safety division youtube channel now you have so uh, you can have you can this share with sir also later Okay, on behalf of NHSRC, I also thank uh, uh, Dr. Amit Gupta, sir, uh, for providing the great knowledge on from the stage of, uh, as I have seen the full, uh, full session, from the stage of uh, like identifying the trauma system gaps till the complete clinical care management, it was really a good session, sir. On behalf of NHSRC, also be thankful to you. And also be thankful to Dr. Sangeeta Sharma, ma'am, for your uh, grateful support. Because without ma'am support, we can't uh, get the guest speakers <laughs> from the AIMS to us. I uh, really be thankful for you, uh, ma'am. And also, I thank for my ED, sir, and Jane, sir, and also my lead consultant, Dr. Deepika Sharma, ma'am, uh, for supporting all, uh, me in conducting these sessions since the month of September 2022. We have started it on the uh, 17th September 2022 in the World Patient Safety Day last year. We have completed now first phase of the lecture series. Uh, for the 12 months and we are going to start the second uh, phase uh, from the next month onwards and I, I informed uh, all the participants that we will share you the next phase uh, uh, topics and all the details uh, with the, uh, the co complete elaborated details like uh, on what topics we are going to uh, conduct the next phase lecture series uh, shortly uh, through your mail id uh, even uh, I were uh, any queries can be mailed to us in the stg.webinar at nhsrcindia.org. Uh, that mail ID will be shared in the chat box. And the participation certificate will be uh, sent to all the participants who attended pre and post test uh, of this session. I think in another two to three days, you will get the, uh, this certificate. Mm -hmm. I hope uh, everyone are uh, uh, getting good knowledge uh, with this lecture series. And uh, I thank everyone, all the participants, uh, uh, for providing the uh, support in making this uh, lecture series of the first phase uh, successful. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Uh, Annapurna, before you close, uh, um, I request to the participants, please uh, fill up the feedback form as well. We will yeah. go through your comments. So please provide us that. That will help us in evaluating the program and uh, designing uh, the next season. Uh, next phase uh, lecture series. And uh, uh, if anybody has interested with the respective topics which you have interested, you can mail us at the stg.webinar at nhsrcindia.org. That link will be, a uh, mail ID will be shared in your chat box. Uh, you can mail us at any time. And for any other queries also, you can mail through that uh, mail ID. Thank you. Pre-test link is closed. <laughs> Somebody is asking for pre-test link. Uh,
We are uh, pre closed now. Before the first session. Uh, okay. Uh, Mommy, if it is not closed, I can, I think I could sure. share it. Okay. 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 Thank you, Deepika. Bye. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Bye.